This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Isotope, Atom Audio, Lewitt, and Spectra 1964. In fact, you're hearing my voice right now on the Lewitt PureTube microphone through the Spectra 1964 STX110D mic pre and C610 complimeter with Isotope, RX, Ozone, and Neutron all recorded safely onto an OWC SSD and mixed on Atom Audio monitors. Please check out our awesome sponsors using the link in the show notes below. It's a great way to help support this show. Now get ready to rock. This might be really helpful for for people is clip gaining and riding automation of the vocal. It's a it's a marriage between getting the compressor set right and the ratio set right and the release and the attack time set right. Like and but when when I say right, all I mean is feels good for the song. So clip gain, I I tend to do earlier in the mix. Like oh, it really does interact the digital information differently. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Atom Audio can provide all your monitor needs. Whether you're setting up a first-time home studio for recording music or podcasts, or a world-class full-size studio for professional mixing and mastering in stereo or immersive sound, Featuring the XART tweeter and custom DSP onboard processing, the A-Series monitors will perfectly adapt to your studio. Get the Atom Audio monitors and subwoofers that are right for you with an extended five-year warranty at atomaudio.com. Are you recording your own music or other people's music in your studio, but you're having trouble figuring out how to get your mixes to sound great? Do they sound kind of weak or distant or lack punch and clarity? Well, I've got a gift to help you take your mixes from sounding like basement demos to sounding much closer to professional mixes. And it's my free course called Mix Master Bundle. This course will show you how to get pro sounding mixes from your home studio with free and stock plugins in Pro Tools, and the best part is that these mixing techniques work for you in any DAW, whether you're on Logic, Cubase, Studio One, Reaper, anything you can think of. If you're ready now to make your best record ever, then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started for free now, and you can find the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Howdy, rock stars! It's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Nick Bullock, a Nashville-based producer, engineer, musician, and artist. And I'm going to quote from his bio. He's been a guest on the podcast before, but he's joining us again, and and we, we pulled some great stuff from his website. So in Nick's own words, one of the many things I was taught as a young man was to follow my curiosity. That curiosity led me to music school, to my band of 10 years, and over 1,500 shows all over the world, and to my love of recording today. It led me to ask questions even when I felt stupid asking them. Does that sound familiar, rock stars? I feel that way a lot. Each and every one of those questions and the discoveries that came afterwards has led to a wonderful life and relationship with music and the artists I work with. Following that curiosity is one of the main reasons I'm still in love with music and recording. Every day I do my best to live by some pretty simple principles. Be honest, be present, try to learn something new, help others dig deep to the best version of themselves they can be, And when in doubt, always reference a Beatles or Stones song. Not kidding. So here I am living in Nashville, Tennessee, married to the love of my life, Meredith, also an amazing visual artist with three incredible and curious boys. I get to make music every day in one of the greatest studios in the world. Each day is a gift. I'm eternally grateful that I get to create music with some of the best people in the world. I definitely feel that way a lot of the times. That's why I wanted to read that too. I just think that that's like, you know... um, the expression of, the, uh, you know, the measure of success in the music business is, um, you know, are you still doing it and yeah. do you love it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so please welcome back Nick Bullock to Recording Studio Rockstars. Nick, my brother, 
Are you ready to rock yet again? Yes, I am. Welcome back, dude. Thanks. It's good to have you here. It's great. I being think here. the last time we did the interview was the the we've done it once, I think, even though yes. I've known you for years. Yeah. And um and we were at your studio. Yeah. Back across in the East day. Nashville, and it was a really cool spot. Yeah. It was great little uh little backyard, typical backyard Nashville studio, about 300, 400 square feet. A great, you know, that that was that was the room that Meredith, my wife, found when she came to check out ten, you know, check out the town, and and when we, when she saw that, I didn't see it at first. She was like, "Yeah, this is where we're going to move to," because we were thinking about New York or L.A. or you know here. Yeah, you like really affordable places. Really affordable. Yeah, well, that, raise a family. Yeah, well, that we didn't have kids at the time, <laughs> and that that all played part. That all played a part in yeah. in making that choice. But when she saw that backyard little dig, she was like, "All right, this is a cool place." You to could be. have your very own blade of grass. <laughs> yeah, taking the F train with three kids. Yeah, and, and your last place, I remember, like you know, you really like looked out over fields. No, I will, it was too, right? no, not I me. Mean, kind of, it was just looked over backyards. It yeah, was, um, yeah. but it was like yeah, over on the on the eastern side, not East Nashville, but on the east east side of town over there. Yeah, and you um, did a great job of setting up the whole studio in a yeah, separate yeah, building, right, right yep. outside of the house, right. so that you could you know rock out and not wake up sleeping babies and all that. Yes. To try not to. I think, I think her biggest complaint was she could still, when we would rehearse, she could still hear the bass carry across the backyard into, into the bedrooms. So and we you always said, had honey, to... that's why I only play lullabies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I said the bass player got to turn down a little bit. <laughs> nice. Man. Um, well, very cool. Well, tell us a little bit about, um, you've just moved to a new space, right? Or, or you're in the yeah. process of it right now. Well, right? we moved, so uh, right at the start of the pandemic, we moved to Kingston Springs. And uh, I and about five or six years ago, I started working full-time at Neil Capolino's studio. So that's my that's my home base of operations for the most part. And, um, and so with that, I didn't necessarily need the backyard thing. I just needed a room to mix. So we decided to get out of town a little bit, which is 20, Kingston Springs is about 20 minutes out of town. It's not, a great spot. It, 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 yeah, it, well. it was. Um, and we were right around the corner from downtown and long story short, we, um, we had to basically tear that house down to the studs, uh, for, health reasons we found mold and uh Eek. um yeah for health reasons but we completely gutted it like literally it's a brand new house from the inside out from the outside it looks like a beautiful old farmhouse like it always had been but in in and in doing so i kind of made a, a really great mix room there and was settling in and uh one thing that meredith and i always wanted with our we have three boys we wanted space and even though kingston springs you think it'd be have have some space it was essentially just the same kind of scenario backyard relatively small not too bad but um then and up then after we lived in it for about a year after it was all renovated we had an uh an opportunity to go in on land so then we moved again and now with the land, there's a bunch of acres involved. And so we're building a house. We sold that basically brand new house. And uh, with that money and some savings, we're able to build a house and build a, a studio. So now I, I uh, work. Did you stay out in the same area or did you like no, find land all the way across town? We found town? like land an hour away in Carthage. So I'm, I'm on that hour bubble. And so I, so right now I commute. So I you go, listen to recording studio rock stars a whole I, As a matter of fact, I, <laughs> I, I, I did. I just listened to uh, the one you did with, um, of course, now I'm going to blank on his name. The, that famous guy. No, that awesome uh, Paul, dude. with Paul, with Paul, Paul Wolf. Yeah. Oh yeah, um, Paul's, Paul was great. Man. Yeah, he's a, a, he's a character. He's a trip. Um, so... Uh, so now I live out there and we are about to break ground on a, on a barn. That's the studio. It's going to look like a barn and then our house and they're going to be attached by a long hallway, but uh, oh, they'll cool. be completely separate, separate buildings. Now we keep the old place. You feel like the, a smart move is to buy into something new, build it and you keep the previous property and convert it to rentals or flip or we like thought about doing that but we couldn't we wouldn't have been able to afford building the studio and right so, i know that's one of the tricky things about thinking like that is when you i remember there was a point at which i was considering with family like yeah oh, i'll keep this house and we'll get something else and then yeah. i was like wait a minute how am i going to pay two mortgages yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know i think i think if we had just had the hopes to build a house then um uh we probably could have done something like that but but um, building the studio, 
my, you know, my favorite experiences have always been, um, when like I've done like the cabin in the woods kind of thing with an artist or a band, like, Hey, let's go out, let's rent out the space in the mountains of whatever and make a record. And the downside to that the upside is always the experience and the music. And the downside sometimes I found was some of the sonics because things are just out of your control because you're not renting a studio. So I right. kind of, I've always had, it's, I've, it's always been a dream of mine to have a space that combines the both. And I don't, I think it was just the way that I was raised, but I really value hospitality too. Hospitality is really important to me. And so I've, I've had this dream of owning a studio that people can come and stay and make a record and um, really just kind of envelop in the experience and the process of, of making their art really, you know, fully be in it. And so that is the goal. So the, the studio will have a little, like a full kitchen apart, like a little apartment cool. with one or two bedrooms and then some bunk beds. So ultimately I'll be able to sleep about five or six people pretty that's comfortably. Great, that's a, that's a yeah. big, bold vision. And I've, it's crazy. I've worked in studios like that yeah. and I've, I've loved it and I've super appreciated it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I've always thought that would be really cool to do. And of course there is that accompanying question mark, which is like, you know, Will people want to come? Of course, yeah. Do all that. Yeah. Um, I've got lots of thoughts about that, but what are some yeah. things that you feel like you've, have you come up with some confident decisions about it beforehand or do you feel like you just got to just sort of like, see, you know, jump in there and and find out a little bit too? Well, in order to make uh, everything make sense and, and, and make the decision before we um, went in on the property, um, I had all everything spreadsheeted out for the last like three or four years. And so just kind of looking at the numbers um, in, in a purely business sense, you know, okay, well, Smart. if I, if I can do, you know, the, the right now I pay X amount of dollars every month in rent over at, over at Neil studio. Um, and I will, okay. So, you know, so what are my, what are my expenses? What do my expenses become? What, what gets traded one for one, you know, dollar for dollar doing here, doing there. And then I also looked at how much of my work was um, out of town artists, or how much I pre COVID I would travel because I would travel not a bunch, not not a, a ton, but enough where it would it's a, it was a thing, you know, a percentage of the income. And so just kind of looking at how much of that percentage of people that come to work for, with me are from out of town uh, versus in town. And it's actually, I was surprised to see it was kind of like a 50 50 split. It's not just all Nashville folks that I work with. Um, and the great thing too is because, um, I'm not really marketing it as a commercial venture. If somebody wants to come into town and make a, if they want to come to town and make a Nashville record and, and hang out music row or hang out anywhere in town and make us or hang out at the, the toy box and make a record with me here or wherever we can always do that. Cause I'm not, I'm only an hour away. So right. if they want, if they feel like if it's, if they want that nightlife experience, whether or not that's a good idea when you're making a record anyway, but like, uh, <laughs> do you have some artists that do that, that they like uh, to like be in the studio and then go out at night? I've, I have had that sometimes, sure, yeah, but it's usually like, you know, a weekend record with some band that's out of town. It's a, there's a, there's a bunch of boys from Philly that come to mind that are, they're, they're amazing, amazing people. And they definitely went out once or twice and we, we had a good time. And like, there's nothing wrong with that. As long as you know, it's gotta be within the flow of, the creative expect, like, um, not expectation, but it's gotta, it's gotta fit with the feelings of the record. Like if we're going to make a, if we're going to make one where, um, it's super vulnerable and, and maybe the, the, the feeling of the record is more of a, an expression of that vulnerability, then it doesn't make any sense to go to Roberts on a Wednesday night. It makes right. no sense to do that. Right. Like that's the, that's the wrong thing to do. But if you're making a funk record and you're from out of town, like, you know, the, the Philly boys made like a soul, my, my friends in Philly, they came down and they made like a soul and soulful funk, you know, record. Um, so unlike Philly. Yeah. Right. I know. <laughs> who, who knew? Uh, who would have guessed? But, uh, you know, it, it just kind of fit into the personality of the vibe of the experience. And I, th I, I again, I'll just go back to that sense of uh, the driving factor for me and all this stuff is what kind of experience do I want people to make? So if, am I nervous about it? Of course. I'm spending a crap ton of money um, going into debt. And I mean, not like I'm trying, we're being, we're making smart decisions, but right. 
it's still, of course, it's a risk. And am I yeah. scared of, of course, but the- That's the thing about business decisions too, and lots of life decisions is like, even when you do all your homework, you're still left with, there's still the nervousness of making the decision. It's still of a little bit of a gamble. You're just like, yeah. you know, moving things in your favor when you make decisions a lot of times. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but maybe we should clarify a couple of things. Sure. So what we're talking about, Rockstars, is this, you know, awesome concept of having a studio that is not sort of in the hub of a city. That's right. That's outside, that has the the accommodations where, where maybe a band comes and stays with you for a week and they sleep there and eat in the kitchen that's and, you, right. and you can work your the hours you want in the studio. And it's an awesome way to make a record. I know that like for myself, when I make records with my bands, I've always preferred that. I wanna yeah, I wanna turn off the rest of the world and yeah. only focus on that record making experience and like yeah. live it. Um yeah. and and we te- I tend to burn the candle at both ends because they're weekend records now. Yeah. And then I need two days to recover. But yeah, you know, yeah, hey, yeah. it's yeah. all right. Yeah. But well, it's cool. But then, like you said, it's the fear that, like, what happens if people don't want to do that? What if they want more of the, like, you know, uh, bankers' hours sessions yeah. and things like that? Yeah. So describe a little bit the difference between, you know, you pointed out out of town and and in town clients. What is a typical difference between working with an out of town client and an in town client? Well, just uh, I mean, you mentioned accommodations. You mentioned so their needs are 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 obviously different. And so if some, when I'm working with a group that's in town or an artist that's in town, um, there can be more flexibility of hours. There could be more flexibility of, um, Hey, the horn players can't make this date, but they can make that date. Is that okay with you? And when somebody is coming into town from out of town, obviously their, their level of need is, is a little bit more, I don't want to say, I don't want to say more, I don't want to say that they're more needy, but it's a little bit more, um, uh, everything has to be a little bit more structured, obviously, and organized. You got to line everything up just right. Yeah, everything needs to kind of flow in a way. And there's an art to that. And I've gotten better at that over time. And, and it's everything from scheduling to, you know, um, well, I, I have never taken care of the hospitality side, per, like personally, but I've helped them take care of themselves. Like I right. direct them to different yeah, it's neighborhoods. A, it's a lot and, more work if you have to do all the grocery sure. shopping. Sure. Yeah, too. yeah, yeah. So all of those, all of those details would be are all, they're not that they're question marks, but they're, they are all to be seen. Like maybe I'll, Meredith, my Meredith just asked me the other day, like, are you going to end up cleaning the sheets off the beds at first? And I'm like, I'm sure at first I'm going to be doing everything. Well, the, the truth is that parallels the decision many people make about, you know, should we do the Airbnb thing? Right. You know, right. And, and that sometimes can seem like, wow, that's how cool you can, you know, just rent an extra space or a room or whatever and make some money. And then you realize you're like, oh, wait a minute. You're kind of on call every yeah, day comes, for comes changing, price tag. you know, doing yeah. laundry and all that. But yeah. it is doable. And, you know, it seems like you could also start out by doing it yourself. And then if you're in an area, you, you might be remote, but if, but there's ultimately there's somebody who oh, yeah. might be hireable. We're just a couple minutes just outside come in of Carthage. And do things like shopping and cleaning and things like that. Too. Exactly. We're just a couple of minutes outside of Carthage. And that's, you know, Carthage. I mean, it's a small town. It sounds town, so but close it's... to Carthage already. It's got to <laughs> be a good right. thing for students. Yeah, right. All you know? the needs are going to be taken care of. It's fine. It'll just show up. Is Carthage where, um, I might be mixing it up, but is Carthage where Calf Killer Brewery is? No, no, that's, not that I know of. That might be. You, um, know, where, you know where Lebanon is, right? Yeah. It's yeah. like, it's just a couple, it's another half hour past yeah. Lebanon. So, yeah, I think I'm thinking of another one. Uh, it's, a, it's another Greek name. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's right. a lot of Greek cities in, in Tennessee. Yep. There's another one out there. Anyway, that's um, some of the guys from uh, the band The Features. One of the guys went off to work at that brewery, but I think it's out okay. that direction too. Okay. Yeah. 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 Cool spot. Yeah. 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 Um, well, very cool, man. So what are some other things that really go into the thinking of, of designing and building a new studio and, and feel free to share this advice as, as giving, you know, what you've learned to yeah, totally. the Rockstar Suit because somebody uh, out there is thinking about it. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, the spreadsheets and kind of looking at it as a, from the business side first, that has to, that has to come first because. And you said you did that for a few years. So you, it's not like you looked at the last three months of spreadsheets. No, it's like you no. need some real. Yeah, what Figures, you know? Right? What's the monthly number going to be that I'm going to have to meet? And have I proven that, you know, over over time? Like, can I can I can I do that? So that and that question goes, 
that obviously answering that question is really answering the question, what can I afford today in a way that's not going to be overly stressful? Because I think the biggest thing, as uh, you you had said earlier about this definition of success is somebody who's still doing it and still enjoying it. Well, one of the biggest ways of still enjoying it is to make sure that your stress as an entrepreneur and as a producer or engineer, as as somebody who wants to get into that field or somebody who's already into it, part of it is just managing that anxiety and learning how to how to do that. So I learned um, kicking and stream and screaming to a degree how kicking to do that. And over- screaming that was a nice <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a nice Freudian slip there, right? For, yeah, for making that's music, right. that's right. It's funny. Uh, yeah, you know. But I learned so I, I learned how to do that over time, and um, and I learned how to take care of the numbers and 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 how to budget time to do that so that it really kind of that's how I know how to answer the questions of, is this a good risk to take? Is this not a good risk to take? And so now I'm in the position where I've, you know, I've been paying rent over at Neil's for four or five years now on the, on this, on the regular, every single month, I owe X amount of X amount of dollars to him, no matter what, that's our agreement. And that's great. And it's been a, you know, working, um, out of his place and, and, under his influence has been a huge, huge way of um, grow, like huge growth. Yeah. And Rockstars, if you don't know Neil Capolino, he's been on the podcast. Amazing yep. um, stuff that he's done. I think we spent a lot of time talking about making records with artists like Alice, Alison yeah. Krauss. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, you know, he's, he really understands that um, pristine acoustic and, and singer kind of um recording space too he is a brilliant engineer and a brilliant yeah he's a ama- he's a ninja he's, and he, he's, he's spent a lot of time talking about all the challenges of the f- studio that he started yeah with too and yeah totally you know, dealing with uh the sounds of the city interrupting sessions and oh yeah clients get being happy or angry and all that kind of stuff yeah man it's 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 uh i've learned you know, you look at him and other people who have multiple Grammys and you kind of think like, oh, they've got all these things figured out and it just, they're, they're, everything comes so easy to them. And like, nope, that's not really true. It's, and it's yeah. not that, you know, he's extremely talented, obviously. So, but and still and, making hard, difficult decisions. Yeah. All you, the time. He still had to learn. He still had to go into, you know, his first day wasn't all that different than my first day. It was right. just yeah. different building. Just you, you know, have curlier hair. Well, yeah. Maybe curly. I can't remember. Does he have curlier hair? He had a, he had long hair back then. Yeah. 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 Um, but anyway, you know, different, different building and different, different, whatever, but same emotion, you know, same emotional framework walking into your first day. So what, what sort of studio, um, have you been working in? It's one that's got control room, live room, ISO booths, that kind of stuff. Like what, what sort of, um, arrangement for recording a band have you found useful and what are you planning towards with your new studio? So that's a great question. Uh, at Neil's, we've got a medium-sized live room. We've got a, a cozy booth and then a second kind of isolation booth. And then we've got the control room and then we've got the hang area. And, and what uh, is medium live room Yeah, that's mean? a good... I, it's not... You, like an instrument, like how many things fit in I can fit in a five-piece. There's a grand piano and with the grand piano in there, and it's a... Well, I know that there are different specs for for it's not a baby grand. It's a it's a full yeah. grand piano, but um, and then we can then I can fit drums, bass, guitar, keys, and if I had to, I could fit another guitar player. And then the you know the singer will go in the booth. The singer will go in the other booth, or upright bass will go in the booth, or sometimes drums will go in the booth. But I can only fit three or four comfortably four mic stands in there with the drummer in there. So and yeah, it's, yeah. so it's, it's like my drum tight. booth in here too. Yes, it's like super tight. The drummer's ass has to pretty much be right in the corner <laughs> of the room, you know, Yeah, the mic stands on the other one. Then I'm like, also, we need to be able to get to that door if anybody needed to escape all of a sudden. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, uh, and then if I really have to, I can also throw an amp back in the hang room kind of, yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. And so what I've learned and, uh, you know, so it's, I don't, I don't know square footage. It's pr- probably. But you can have the drum set and feet. then you can yep. have, when you say all the musicians and the piano and like in my case, the piano would have to be right next to the drums. And I've actually yeah. made a really great sounding record that way. And I was yeah. pretty uh, well, and I've done, I've, I've had. I've had it work out great a number of times. Other times it can feel quite challenging. Yeah. 
Howdy, rock stars. I've got a secret to tell you about how I get a consistent sound mixing over a thousand hours of recording studio rock stars. My secret is using Isotope, RX, Ozone, and Neutron on every single episode. Right now, you are hearing RX Breath Control, D-Click, D-Clip, D-S, Deplosive, Voice Denoise, Ozone Multiband Compression, Neutron EQ, and Limiting, all from Isotope. Go to isotope.com slash rockstars and use the secret code ROCK10 to get 10% off. It's amazing how that can work when it's done right and when the song and the performance is right. Like those piano mics can, I've found that an open lid piano mic, um, even if it's not an open lid, I, I had it successful for a jazz record with the lid wide open. I've had it successful with the lid closed and taping, I hate, I hate to say I'm putting taping things in my Steinway, but um, taping PZM mics to the underside of the lid is kind of a uh, nice cheat for, you know, a closed lid piano totally. miking, and the piano can become it just becomes part of the drum sound. It becomes right. the room mics for it. You know. Yep. I've had mixed mixed results doing that, and it all just if I was doing a jazz record, I would absolutely have no problem doing that. Yeah. But I, nobody's hired me to do a jazz record yet, uh, so I've had mixed mixed things. And the thing that I so the that room is tuned really well. And all I mean by that is that it sounds really good. It's not dead. It's not live. It's kind of somewhere in the middle. And I can throw up a room mic on the drum kit, a stereo, like, uh, you know, the R88 ribbon. Um, that's I'll throw up something like that. And and then, you know, in, in mixing, I can take that sound and I can make it feel a lot bigger if I have to. And, and kind of, you know, I've learned the tricks to kind of, oh, you want a huge drum sound? Okay, cool. So you that want, can want be something a, tight? Okay, cool. That can be a helpful measure for the rock stars of whether or not their drum room is working or not is potentially like put up a stereo mic above the drum kit. And it's like, does that feel like you could work with that if you yeah, wanted to? Yeah. Well, I always put um, a stereo pair above it, but then I'll 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 put something in the, in the room too, and that's what I'm referring to when I say like that. That you can kind of take that and carve that into something really kind of unique if the yeah. room sounds good. And and I'd imagine that if if that doesn't if it doesn't sound good on the source, like if you just you know for me I'll pull up those two faders of that stereo um, drum room mic, and it, and it sounds good already like okay cool and, and it's got a little bit of room to it so then you can kind of magnify that ambience more or you can you can't really get rid of it because it is what it is it yeah. kind of sounds like a drum kit from not direct sourced you know yeah maybe we should qualify the kinds of um sounds that you might be getting on a record too so we're not necessarily talking about metal drums which no. is a totally different kind of thing you point. know and um not necessarily talking about bashing rock drums, although that might be something that you do sometimes sure. too, right? Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but definitely I heard a lot of, uh, I'm always at a loss for the right, you know, what's the, what's the term of the, the of the day? Yeah. But I mean, almost like songwriter, indie songwriter pop yeah. or something like that, you know? Yeah. The, t yeah. It's so it all. could have synths, could have electric guitars and drums and right. bass, but definitely there's a voice up front that's singing lyrics that need to be heard like a songwriter yeah. or two at times. But then, yeah. um, you know, so many, uh, like Katie Cuffle, great sounding. Yeah. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, but you are. Yeah, yeah. amazing sounding voice too. On yes. that. So, so lots to talk about there. And then a record that leapt out and I was playing it when you walked in was Wanderers. Yeah, yeah. Um, which reminded me of like um, the Black Keys or something, just yeah. that great kind of blues rock yeah. sound. Yeah. So a great collection of different sounds and yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so typically it's, it's not... I, I've I've never done a metal record and I've never done a hip hop record. And it's not that I wouldn't, it just those artists haven't found me or I haven't found them. Yeah. Everything else, everything else is pretty much fair game. And I and I yeah, everything else is pretty much fair game. And to answer the question about um what I've learned working over at Neil's and then kind of move how I how that's affected my decision making moving forward, the live room in the my space that I'm building now is going to be a about 700 square feet, but a little bit more than that, but it's a third of that is going to be my control room and it's open. So there'll be a loft space that, that is, 
where that part of people where, where they can sleep. This is why I'm doing the barn. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm kind of talking with my hands here. So sorry, folks. <laughs> but the He's barn, drawing pictures of barns yeah. in the air. <laughs> but the, so my listening, my listening position will be right underneath where the loft juts out. And so all of that will be treated nice and tight. But then the rest of the other, you know, 400, 450 square footage is all just going to be big and open. And I, and then I'm going to have a drum booth that's about 115, 120 square feet. So, so bigger than what I have now over at Neil's, but also tight. And then an amp ISO booth and a keys ISO booth with the piano in it and the Leslie in it. And so I, the, so that when the band's performing, they might be in the room with you. They'll be in the live room. Yeah. Unless the sing like, yeah. see this, the, the one thing that I knew I wanted was options. Yeah. So if I want to throw the drums in the big room, then that's what I'm going to do. Then the singer goes or the upright bass player goes into the drum booth. Yeah. Did you hear that whatever. rock stars, your singer and your upright bass player, they <laughs> go away from your drums. <laughs> they go away Most from the drums. Most of the time. Yeah. I hate to say it. But again, it all depends on, it's just, it. You know, I've, I'm reading a um, uh, Rick Rubin just released a, just released a great book, and oh, it's all no, oh, about that's right. it's all about creativity. And you know, one of the things he said is, whatever you normally do, just try consider doing the exact opposite. So yeah, there, there's yeah. part of my brain that's just like, yeah, you know, I should make one of those records. I mean, I've done it. It's been a while since I've lined up. You know, the the drummer in the middle then the two amps on the guitar and the wings all facing the same way. And then the bass amp right next to the kick drum facing the same way as the guitar amps, yeah. as if it was all on stage. Like I should do that. We should, I should do that record again. I haven't done yeah. that in a long yeah. time. Yeah. Or, or um, It really is time to put the, the AKG D112 on the <laughs> snare drum. <laughs> that's right. well, hey, the 57 well, hey, the Let's kick. get crazy. Let's get crazy. Uh, yeah, but there's, there's an element of that... Um, I think it, the more I, I'm able to stay out of linear thinking, the often the better it is. Well, I find it, it's really helpful to me when other people come into the studio to work on stuff, other engineers particularly, or other producers, because then, you know, I just do what they suggest and I yeah. love it. It's like a, the more it breaks my standard MO for how to mic up right. a session, the totally. happier I am. I'm like, because part of me is, it's a little bit of a cheat. I'm like, I'm like, oh, great. Because if this sounds like shit, it's not my fault and I can find <laughs> out, you know? But I mean, it's it's really cool. And then doing stuff really quickly. And also when you're under the gun in a session and you need to just do the overdub, like right this second and you yeah. just grab whatever mic is there yeah. and point it and it's across the room or it's wherever. And then later you're like, man, that was a great sound. You yeah, know? yeah. Yeah. I guess a challenge with that stuff is remembering what the hell you did too. Cause yeah. If totally. you want to repeat it, maybe Rick would be like, why repeat it? Break totally. it again, you know, for next time. Totally. <laughs> that, you know, that's fair. That the idea of like knowing exactly how to do something so that we can repeat it is also a bit of a crutch. You know, it's a bit of a shackle on our creativity yeah. at times because it does force us to not really use our ears and try stuff. Yeah. I, um, I went through a period of time where I specifically didn't write down any microphone. Well, like I think on, that was called 52 and on, 52. On track. Yeah. But no post. Yes. Well, tell, definitely us, that. Tell, tell the rock stars what that was. Cause that was, we talked about that last time. Yeah. That was a project, uh, where I wrote and recorded and mixed, uh, and tried to fully produce it as much as I could one song a week for and a And that whole was year. in your new studio when you had moved to Nashville. That right? was in the brand new studio. The first one that Meredith had found that I mentioned earlier. Yes. And, and, um, yeah, and that was like a just a boot a, a way of boot camping myself. In yeah, a it was sense. A, it was a way of moving, you know, getting started and establishing your own skills and something to show for it. Yeah, and putting your it's like your self inflicted graduate school or something <laughs> yeah. like that. Um, so, just to be fair, um, what tips do you have for the rock stars? So, if somebody's thinking, "Wow, that would be amazing," but how do I do that? You know how how would you advise somebody? survives and pays bills during a 52 and 52 kind of stretch? Well, that's a great question, Lynch. Yeah, that is fair, the, right? that is the that is, I don't ask the easy ones here, do I? <laughs> that is the million dollar question or perhaps the hundred thousand dollar question or whatever it is. Uh, at the time, this is pre-children, Meredith was working. I had, um, I got off the road. I'll give just a really quick story. I got off the road when I was about 31, 30, uh, met my wife, got married, started a teaching business, 
real in upstate New York, uh, where I'm Ithaca. Where, where I yes, where I was friends with your lovely cousin. Jenny. And they paid you in Ithaca dollars. They oh, <laughs> never took those. <laughs> never took those. Hopefully, they paid you in Bitcoin. Yeah. Oh, n- nor that. Um, and then sold that business and moved down to Nashville. So my first year year, I didn't have to because I sold the teaching business. I I. I kind of had set myself up to wow to kind of you built do and that. sold a business, so you did, really do yeah. have an entrepreneurial. I've been self spirit. I've been self employed as a musician since I was eighteen. But I mean, the the concept of yeah. creating a business like recording studio rock stars is a business for sure. me. But my totally. brother, on the one hand, you know, he understands that, and he would think of it as something that you build, that you would set up so that you could sell it if you wanted. I I haven't. I don't just don't think like that yet. Right. But what um. Right. Um, I know this might be too much of a pivot, but that involves things like being, uh, you know, you have to have really good bookkeeping for a certain number of years and stuff yeah. like that. And it has to be established and totally, you have to be able to remove yourself from the equation, right? That's correct. Yeah. Um, that's, that, that, all of that was all part of the conversation with the, there was a music store that bought it from me nice. and it made total sense for them because they could. Uh, the intellectual, you know, the intellectual property that went along with it is also part of what they bought. So I wrote out my methodology for not like, this is the Lydian scale. Play it. This not like that. You mean like the poster that's behind <laughs> your head on the wall right there? Yes. Beautiful. <laughs> Cause I'm trying to relearn guitar. <laughs> it's good. It's a good thing, man. It's a good one. One thing I miss about teaching is that, uh, is, it just kind of keeps your chops up at all yeah. times. But, um, uh, so the so the the methodology of how of how to teach the and what to teach and when to teach and how to market it and all those all that was kind of part of the IP for for that business. So that's really what they bought. Now, and, could you see somebody doing the same thing for a studio or a production I mean, business or something like that? A studio is a little bit like it depends. Does the studio ha- come with a staff? Is it or is it one? Is it one person? Is the like for me the studio that I'm building? It's not a commercial studio, so people are not. It's not that I wouldn't be open to other engineers or producers coming into town and using it because I, 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 <laughs> yeah. no, I, I think I would, but no, I think I think I would kidding. be okay with that. I think, but it's not, it's not that, you know, it's not, it's not a commercial studio. It's my studio. So people yeah. are coming to work with me primarily. So that is hard to sell. You know, it's like, it, there's the, there's the Jan Hammer model, right? Where you get a bunch of producers underneath you. And Jan Hammer is the um, obviously he's a very famous uh, composer for film and stuff for those who don't know. But he's got and he plays given, a lot of cool analog synth sounds. Tons. Too. I imagine I can't imagine what his keyboard room looks like. But you walk in, you know, his business model is you've got five or six people at any given point who are all producers themselves who all write music under the name Jan Hammer. And yes, he comes and gives his blessing and is yeah, this is great. This is not try do that again. This is great. And all, but all of that is under his production house. And so could he sell it? Probably, Pro, you know, maybe, maybe not. But could somebody like... Um, yeah, I think you can. Kinda, when you, you when know. you build a business to the point at which you're, there's a real brand recognition around a name, then it becomes like selling a, a law firm, you know, where it's like nobody, right. like who are those names on right. the, the thing? Right. We never heard of them or, yep. you know, um, oh, what was I going to say about that? Um, yeah, the, that that kind of thing, being able to remove yourself from the equation, being able to um, do that. I mean, this we're going on a bit of a tangent, but I think it is a fascinating idea. You totally. Know, the, the idea that when we build what we do with our careers in music, it doesn't just have to be about us in a hobby. It could, you know, there you can think about it like, do I want to build a business that is that has a value in a, in and of itself that right. can be sold to somebody, right? And it, and I think to do that, it involves things like you need to have the assets for the business to function. You need all the, you know, right. all the stuff that you record with potentially. You need the staff. You need the the structure for managing. You need the name recognition. Yeah. You need the marketing so that like yep. if somebody steps in to buy it, they just keep the same thing running and it continues to yep. bring in clients and generate right. income and everything. For me, and, that- an online version of that for like a mixing business or something might be a very realistic consideration. Yeah, yeah totally. Uh, absolutely. It, 
for me, it that filters through to once I have the physical space that is my own, um, then I want to start a publishing company and I want to start a record label eventually. But I, I kind of it's hard for me to do that right now when I'm when I'm paying rent over at Neil's because I d- I don't have twenty four seven access. And so I can I can invest into a project. If I was the label head or a label owner or whatever you want to call it, I can invest my time into a project or I can invest my dollars into it. And right now I've got more time that I would uh, that that I would invest as opposed to necessarily time and cash. So the you know the the value proposition there is once I once I have the studio up and running, then I'm going to look at the numbers and say, well, how much time do I actually have to give to a project? with no fee involved or anything, you know, as part of a label. And where, when is the right time for me to start that? What does that look like? Who do I want to start that with? Right. What kind of conversation do I want to have with the artist about that? How do I build that business model? Do I bring in other business partners? I've got, there's, um, I have kind of a quasi manager by no means a day to day to day, but somebody I check in with monthly or biweekly and kind of big picture kind of like things. Business coach almost. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and there's no, um, well, it's a really lovely relationship and and she's an amazing lady. She's a very smart lady. And um, it'll be really fun to see where that relationship goes because now the potential is opening up for that relationship. So maybe I'll bring in a, an official business partner at some point and, the, you know, for the publishing company and the, and the label and all of those things can kind of coexist because I think ultimately the thing that I really, uh, the my mantra over the last for three three years, let's say probably yeah, three two to three years maybe. Because when will this end? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, no, it's the it's the opposite. It's, when can I go back outside? It's I it's I wanted I I I got tired of waiting for somebody to ask me to come to take part in their cool kids table. I always kind of looked at these right. labels that I really loved. I was like, man, I just can't wait for them to pick me to produce I, their record. I know record. that feeling. You know? I'm just gonna make my own cool kids table. That's the only thing I've ever known how to do anyway. Yeah, I've never yeah. been cool anyway. It's just bring, you know, it's like create my own musical and business family and the people that I believe in. And that's what gets me. Like those are the records I can't wait to it's make. It's such and a hard lesson to learn because I found um, multiple times in my career that the most positive reaction I get from other people um, not not always. Sometimes I I do somebody else's record for them, and I get that positive reaction. But I'm surprised at all the times where I just show somebody what I was doing that I thought was just kind of my own thing that was just fun, yeah. like my own cool kids table, like yeah. you just said, yeah. and and then get this really great response. Yeah. You know, in fact, the biggest band signing I ever got felt like a project like that. Yeah. It, was, it was the Spinto band. Oh yeah. Um, that I produced with Robin Eaton. Yeah. And it was, you know, for me at the time, I was also working with this other band that was, you know, hot shit on a hot shit record label. And, and I always thought, oh, well, that's serious. And this other stuff I'm doing is really, is fun, but it's yeah. like, we're just goofing around. Yeah. You know? And then, and then in the end, yeah, you know, thank yeah. you. Thanks to the, the far seeing vision of Robin Eaton and, and the band, um, and our man, co-manager, Mike Dixon, you know, we were able to find a home for them on an amazing label and an yeah. MVP and, you know. A great thing. A great thing. Yeah, better you, than the other stuff I'd worked on. I, that's another, like, it, it, it's, I think we all have intuition. I think, well, I'll, I'll, say, I'll say that that totally rings true from in my experiences of like when we're, whenever I've been really able to help folks key into the process in a really organic way. And I, I'll use cheesy words like organic because I don't know how else to describe it, but there's like a like a holistic approach to it that really feels like on a DNA level, like it's just, it makes sense. It feels good. Yeah. Those are always the records that, have, uh, that I feel like do the, it's very do the true best. To self, right? Yeah. Yeah. Those are all the records that I've gotten the most com- quote unquote compliments on, or somebody's like, Oh, I heard you, that you did this and this, you know, th- th- those are the records that people seem to really connect with. So again, it goes back to like, you know, the, the, the stuff that I said on the website, like I, even, I it's funny. I wrote that three or four or five years ago. I, I still stand by all that stuff. Like those are the reasons why we do what we do because I do want to make people when you when you allow people to be the best versions of themselves like there's a there's a wonderful gift in that and and part of the consequence I I think is that uh they end up making better art 
because of it, because yeah. they're able to step into, into the, you know, they, they step into that in a really easy way. My studio is proudly powered by OWC, and I love how it's improved my workflow. OWC can connect all your audio work drives, trackballs, mix controllers, MIDI keyboards, audio interfaces, displays, or cameras so that you can work fast and focus on making your best record ever. Go look at the Mini Stack STX, Thunder Bay 4, or Gemini Thunderbolt 3 dock at maxsales.com slash rockstars to find the perfect solution for your studio from OWC. That's one of the nice things about camping out with a record, too, is you create this world that sometimes is too insular. Sometimes you're not, you know, it's like a mixed reference. You do need to check yourself against sure. the benchmarks. But when you create a world for making a record and you're immersed in it, then I feel like it 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 helps you and the people you're working with create the set of rules and language and a whole lexicon for like how to speak the record, you know, and I'm, I'm being metaphorical here, yeah, but, yeah. but it allows you to arrive at all the things that, that tell you whether you're doing the right, you know, these are the right answers or the wrong answers and everything. Yeah. And it's great. And you just come out and, and in the end, you know, you come out probably with this terrified sense of doubt about it all, which is normal. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then, you know, you get away from it for a minute and then you play it again and you're like, oh shit, that was so great, you know? Yeah. Or you play it for other people and they're like, wow, it was really cool. And, yeah. and that's just such a great feeling. Yeah. And, you know, you're talking about getting compliments from people. Um, rock shows, don't get me wrong. Compliments are nice. They don't always come with a check, but sometimes compliments <laughs> do come with a check and they, it might be a big check, you know? Big sure, payment, yeah. Payday, so. Yeah, totally. So it's worth it's worth really finding out what your true motivation is for music, what your true voice is and just yeah, putting as much of your energy and effort into that as you can. Yeah. One of the, the best advice I got from uh, a friend when I first moved to town, um, she's a great songwriter and the best advice that I got from her, cause I wasn't sure when I moved to town, if I would be just a, like a, writer or if I would be a road guy or if I would just be a studio session player or a producer all because I I did all of those things and I still do all of those things and and but the best advice I got was just be yourself and let people catch up to you because of course there's you know there's the there's the idea of you know your taste needs to meet your expertise um you know the what are they what uh it's called the uh, um uh, you mean that whole Philip Glass quote where it was like the yes. body of work? Yes. What yeah. is it? There's a word for it that I'm, my mind is. But anyway, so so let let people like do what you do, and then people are going to find you with with a like mind. And so when you when you when you want to make a living doing it, I think there's there's maybe an added element of of something else that gets that gets added to that equation, but it's still. It doesn't mean that the equation isn't true and it doesn't mean that it still doesn't work because I've found that time and time again that um I you know I have not won a Grammy yet and I have you know I have not so I've not worked on a platinum record produced a platinum record yet and but people have found me and I've found people and it's happened every single month and there's a lot that goes into that but it's at the same time it's um it's me very much just being myself and meeting people where they are. And, you know, and so I think ultimately, um, I think that advice served me really, really well because I, I when I moved to town, I would be nervous about f finding my niche, finding like, what is it that I do? But then th throughout the time, throughout well, that first year. That's why it was smart so, to just hide out for a year. Making a new song of your own every week. <laughs> yeah, I yeah totally, and it was, that that really helped because I learned that room that way too. And I uh, I also, but I was I was going out almost every other night, and you know, going to the basement, or going to the five spot, or going wherever, um, wherever all the cool kids were hanging out. <laughs> you know, one of the things that you did that really struck me too, and is a reflection of your smart business sense for all of the music that you make, was I remember there was a time where. I think you needed you you either didn't have the place back in your studio to meet with people or you just wanted it to be in a new atmosphere. 
Um, and so you were going to Pinewood Social Club and you would like set up a day and you just set up meetings all day long. Yeah. You just sat there. You're like this, you're like the, this godfather figure, yeah, you know, that's at the, not true, but. At the restaurant, <laughs> you know, yeah. people sit down and I think I came and had a meeting with you there too. Yeah. But I, I was like, wow, that's pretty clever. You know, you just had that one person come. I mean, imagine you might've gotten sick of the table after a while, but yeah. it, was, it just seemed like a clever way to, um, you know, kind of create a, an office space and have meetings with people and sort of make it feel flashy maybe too, or, or yeah. just maybe it was just a good vibe for interacting with folks and figuring out what you wanted to do about making yeah. records and things. Flashy. I, I, I try. Yeah. That's funny. I think that the one thing that has served me is, um, I try very hard to understand the two sides of the brain. So there's, there is, there's, and I try, you know, I, I, we were all given them for a reason. And I think sometimes it, it can be easy to downplay. If you're an artist, it can be easy to downplay. Well, I just don't do things like this way because I'm an artist. Or right. if you're a, if you're, you know, if you work at MIT, it might be easy to downplay. Well, I just don't pick up a paintbrush because that's silly because I'm, I'm a mathematician. And so I think embracing both sides of your brain as much as you can the yin and the yang or however you want to kind of describe it. So when I am, I'm very much a feelings guy. I am very, you know, I'm very much, I very much live in my feelings. And that's what I think makes great art to the extent that we're all able to make it. I think it's very much tied into the, into stepping into the feelings surrounded, surrounding whatever topic you're writing about or playing about or singing about or, or whatever, or producing. And, and everything, and of course, sonics come into play and all those things because they all impact the feeling. But sometimes it's also equally important to just say, well, let me put on my business hat right now. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to think about like, like I, it's 2.30 in the afternoon and it is not my hour to think about the color blue. Right now it's my hour to think about, uh, you know, how am I going to whatever the goal is. And so both, uh, you know, all, uh, all of my parents are, they're all entrepreneurs. They're all self-employed. That's the only thing I've ever witnessed as a, as a person. And there's nothing wrong with wanting a paycheck either. Sometimes I hit my head against the the forehead against the wall and say, man, I wish like, I wish somebody I could just clock in and clock out. Yeah. Uh, and that's all part of managing that anxiety, which I'm still learning how to be better at still after 10, this is my 10th year in Nashville now. And so anyway, but my point is, you know, learning how to live out of both of those things, I think it serve, will serve anybody. It, you know, it, I think it's only made the art that much more richer to, to be able, you know, the, I, I'm about to release a solo record at some point this in the next 12 months. And the only reason I was able to do it is because I could, I've, I've been able to take the time to do it. And so you know, that, that has everything to do with organization and business and, and making sure that everything is, you know, I making sure that I hired that I hired the the same folks that are playing on my record are the people that I hire all the time for other people's records. Yeah, and so I, all, all of these things serve each other. That, I think that's my ultimate point. It's yeah. the yin and the yang and they both serve each other. You, you know, it makes life more rich because of it. Yeah. Um, I, I also hired musicians to track a five song record that I'm still working on because I'm slow. See, that's the hey, thing. Man, I hear when I hired them, we went into the studio for two days and um, I still had to kind of like reassemble one of the songs because we did it very quick at the very end. But, you know, we banged out five songs and got them going and I knew what to do next. And then after I got past that, then it's just now, now the ball's just in my court. It's just me playing, you know, against a backboard yeah. I'm not even playing a full game of tennis anymore <laughs> yeah. or ping pong. And, and yeah. it's hard to keep that motivation up. So smart to hire people to play on your own record too. I think that's a thing we sometimes forget that like that's legit. And, yeah. and it, it can be a great way to move our music forward quickly. But I wanted to say about the um, going to the Pinewood Social Club, going to you know a restaurant or coffee shop or a shared workspace to do some of the business stuff. Another thing that's smart about that is it's separation of, you know, task and creativity, which I do think is important. I think that, um, you know, even if we're just talking about mixing, it's clear everybody talks about like, 
you know, separate the mix setup stage from the right. creative mixing stage, right. you know, where, where they're, cause they are two different parts of the brain and they're two different uses of your energy and time. Right. And one of the things that's amazing for us in our generation is the computer, which can do anything. And one of the worst things that has ever happened for us in our generation is that the thing that we use to do one thing can also do anything. So like when we sit down in the studio to make music, if that same space is one where we pay bills or have to manage the business side of what we do, then it's this constant reminder, you know? So for me, like even having a studio space, at least I get out of the house, you know? It's like the house feels like a certain kind of tasks and chores that have to be done and the studio feels like an escape from that. And um, and I think maybe letting your creative studio space be a place where it's like really you're just focused on music and maybe you can take care of the invoicing and other stuff somewhere else. I've always been envious of studios that even have enough space for an office. Totally. You know? Yeah. Where it's yeah. like you go, you go send your invoice in the office, but you yeah. go to the control room just to make music. Yeah. And there's a lot of wisdom. There's a lot of wisdom to that. Yeah. And some people, you know, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, the studio computer is not even connected to the internet. Usually that yeah. had to do with like, Technical reasons, but it might have also sure. be like, you know, it's just like, hey, you can't yeah, you can't go browse the internet or do do that other stuff. Yep. I'm yep. not sure how it would how it would manage the studio right now if it wasn't connected to the internet. It'd be tricky. You can't even open your Pro Tools very easily, right? Yeah, I don't know how you would do that with all the updates and all, you know, to, and and yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that though. There's no at the uh at I call it the farm. <laughs> at the farm, there's no cell service. So, and that was very intentional on our part. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, there's, there'll be, there'll be internet, you know, there will be internet, but you know, when you're doing anything creative separation like that, I think the, the, I think the, the end result really can be impacted in a positive way by, by the immersive experience. And so the more you can kind of allow that to unfold, I think the the better. So just like you're saying about like having an office space to go do bills. It's funny because Meredith and I were just talking about, you know, every square foot is X amount of dollars. And so I was, I was telling her that like, no, I don't want to go out into the control room and do the finances for, and pay the bills. I right. really like, I don't, it's funny. I just, I was, I'm literally speaking to the exact same thing. I, I don't think I, I wish I would have thought it, put it more el eloquently to her in that, in that case. All I could be, all I was saying at the, that moment was making my case for, I just don't want to do that. I don't know how to explain it. I just don't want to do that. But it's really true when you, if you can allow things to kind of be their own kind of holy place, that's a really, that can be a really that can be a gift to that, you know, to the creative spot. That can be a real gift. Yeah. You know? I wonder if Picasso was writing out invoices, you know. Yeah. No, the man, I, I don't think he was. <laughs> I think he was going to restaurants and signing his name and getting all, you know, there's your check. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Audio introduces the all-new A-Series line of monitors, featuring the XART accelerated ribbon tweeter design, built-in DSP-based room correction, and speaker voicings, allowing you to customize your Atom Audio monitors to your control room. The A-Series will rock in any studio. Small studio spaces or immersive multi-speaker configurations are perfect for the A4V or the new A7V, the next generation of the incredibly popular A7X. Mid-sized rooms and narrow spaces will love the low-profile A44H, expanding on the A7V sound, or the A77H, a true three-way midfield monitor delivering rich, spacious sound. And bigger studios will love the A8H, a three-way speaker and the pinnacle of the A-Series that delivers extremely accurate sound required for critical listening environments. Get the Atom Audio monitors and subwoofers that are right for your studio with an extended five-year warranty at atomaudio.com. 
Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session, a.k.a. the second half of the show. <laughs> My guest today is Nick Bullock joining us here at the Toy Box Studio. What up, Nick? What up, Liz? <laughs> and um, you ready to jam? Absolutely. All right, so let's go into some, let's geek out on some um, some studio stuff and some All gear right. stuff and fun stuff, too. Um, lots of questions for you. One of the first things I'll ask about is, I think you mentioned that you are also using um, the SSL UF8 yes. mixer yeah. as part of your studio setup, and you yeah. seem pretty excited about it. I've got two right now in yeah. my studio, and I'm still a little bit brand new to it, um, so I'm learning my way through it. Uh, so far, I've discovered a lot of cool things about it, but tell us a little bit about what your experience has been with that one. It's been great. I, I, it's, and maybe yeah. tell, say what it is. The me. UF8, the, uh, um, uh, you know, eight fader... Uh, talks to pro tools nicely. I can, you can do all the fader rides you want in there. You can do fader rides for any sends as well. Um, and that's where I, I really love it, but I, you can also kind of, you know, it could take the place of the mouse, although, and the keyboard, but there are some things that I've found personally where I'm like, ah, there's no way that's going to beat the speed of doing that, you know? And so right. there are, there are different elements that I, that I've kept on the mouse and the keyboard, but different elements that I've found myself using in particular the UF8 for as well. So I really, I think it's, I think it's a great, I, it's a great product. I also like it for, um, there are, it's really easy to get a quick mix happening for, for overdub day. So if I, if I make, if I'm at the studio for five or six days with a band and then we need to take it back to my place to do the extra day or two that ends up getting tacked on sometimes, you know, it's super easy to, to in the middle of, pulling up the song and listening to it first, just kind of rifle through. I'm just getting the rough mix happening for headphones. And it, and it's, I mean, because everything is just happening out of the monitor path at that point, you know, for the home studio. Right. So, so what, what makes it quick? It's the fact that there's faders, faders on it. That absolutely. You just, you just levels yeah. go up and down and you find balances so yeah. much faster. Because if, when it, with the mouse, you're having to do one fader at a time. And when you've got yeah. a eight, or 16 faders, you can move a lot of things all at once yeah. quickly. I, right? I want to get two as well. So you've got two. I can like eight, even in eight, I find that kind of limiting because I'm like, oh man, I got to bank over. And I, you know, I'd rather just have everything is always where it is in Pro Tools. I, I'm sure we all kind of find how, how we like to set that up after yeah. so many records. So everything is kind of where it, you know where it is, but um, just to have 16 channels would be even better. But having the eight is great. It's way better than mousing around on one and um, I think I had the pro, what is it? I, I forget what I had the one, you know, the one channel. Oh, the pre Yeah, um, Yeah. Which, yeah. which uh, looking, I thought was great at the time, but you know, I'm glad I graduated to the eight and it's nice. You can have different, I'm not, you know, I only use pro tools, but you can kind of bank in logic. You can, it can kind of have its own personalized setup for the different DAWs that are out there. Yeah. So you can kind of yeah. go back and forth between them relatively easy and have things kind of pre set up in a way saved in a way. Um, yeah, I don't do multiple DAWs at once very often. It's, it's, it's rare for me. But if you were working that way, what's cool is when you flip over to the other DAW, you flip over from Pro Tools to Logic, or um, I think we would work with Ableton Live too, or mm -hmm. Studio One, for example. Yep. It will just immediately the faders of the other DAW are reflected on, yeah. on there, which can be cool. Yep. Uh, maybe you have to hit the button yep. on it. Um, and to select a fader, you just hit the select button yeah. and now that fader is the one, um, well, the funny thing is you don't have to hit any buttons. I mean, if you, if you look at the names of the faders, yeah. you just start moving the faders up and down. Right. And I guess the pan knob is right there too. If it you is have the right setting. Depending on what setting you're yeah, on. You so can, you, can, you can vary you can, it for other things. That's too. right. You can, I kind of go back and forth between auto, automation setting, which does not you think it would have a pan aspect to it but it doesn't or regular or you know whatever you want like non-automation i forget i know where the, i know where the button is on the on the gear i just don't remember what they call it so if you press the automation button now you have access to the buttons where you can say you know read the automation or go into write mode and do right. a touch that's right touch right and you can do that with a, sends. update on a particular level or send sends yeah. is really useful because that's the big there's, yeah. there's the times where you want to throw things into different effects and right. bring the you know the reverb sends up and down and right. all that kind of stuff not only can you do it with the aux sends and pro tools but you can also do it on the actual plugin as well so you can kind of go you know once you go into the 
into the, uh, so that's, that's the main reason that I got it so that you can literally tweak something in a delay, um, or literally tweak, um, you can do, of course you can do all of those within pro tools and, and a mouse as well, but at the click of a button, you can, you can go into automation mode at a click of another button. It's either going to be the aux send, or it's going to be the actual plugin itself that right. you can automate. You can, so it's they nice. have buttons that will let you say, I think you can, with Pro Tools, it'll talk to up to five plugin slots. Yeah, yeah. So if you're um, working with those first five plug plugin slots, you can just press the plugin and then one, and it makes that plugin pop up on the screen. Yeah. Press three. Now that plugin pops up on the screen. And what's cool for me is I also have the U UC1, which yeah, is the yeah. the um, SSL channel strip yep. controller, basically, and it also controls the the quad compressor, yeah. the SSL compressor. Yeah. And um and that's really hip because you can get it to start, um, you know, to kind of be in lockstep sync where, you know, you press select on a particular channel and then that plugin is already popping up and you just reach for the EQ or the compression. Yeah. And I love this being able to work quickly like that. I yeah. find that when everything is working well, um, when I can grab the fader and the right EQ and compression, you know, SSL channel strip is up, and and I can just grab the knobs and go. Mm -hmm. I'm able to like make faster, bolder decisions about mm -hmm. um, the balance in yeah. a mix. So I talk about this a little bit. Um, I, I even said this in the uh, SSL has been a sponsor on the on the podcast um, and might still be. And um, <laughs> and I talk about that and what I had to say about it was like, you know, we we grow we come into all this playing a guitar playing an instrument and it has this immediacy that makes us excited and we want to play guitar yeah like why shouldn't our mixing feel like that yeah like why do we have to all of a sudden go to um pinewood social club <laughs> and you know put on a business hat to start mixing like everything's done at one at a time it's yeah. like no nah, i want to just play it like a guitar as best i can yeah yeah i love the i love the hybrid mix world that's where i'm you know i don't even if I, I think I do want to get a console for the, for the front end of things in the new studio. And number one, I'm used to working on one. I don't mix on one, but I'm used to the workflow of tracking a band live and QSENs and all that kind of stuff. And there's a great, Neil has a great, um, it's the Doghouse studio, by the way, that's the name mm -hmm. of Neil's studio. Yeah. Um, and I think you can look, look that up on uh, Instagram. Um, but uh, he's got a wonderful Trident in there, 80 oh, series. It's yeah, it's a great console. But for mixing, I love the hybrid. I, I love the hybrid experience um, for recalls. And I, I always print. I've got a lot of outboard gear that I use, but I always, I've just time aligned them. Um, uh, or that's not the right way of saying it, but um, uh, uh, yeah, anyway, just, you know, align them up uh, so that, I can print things really easily and then I just print it and forget about it. Like there it is, it's done. And then that makes recalls really, really easy. Yeah. And so I've found riding on, on that. I think the ultimate, I would love to, I would love to get something that has, I would love to be, and right now I'm summing through uh, this, the Rupert Neve satellite, which is really great. Cool. Um, and ultimately, I think whatever console I, I'll get, I'll keep the satellite as an option, but I, I'd also want to be able to sum through the console as well. And Can you I've, describe how the Rupert Neve satellite summing works? Yeah, it's 16, 16 channels. It's got the silk function, which is really nice, and it has the blend knob. Um, is it an interface of its own or something? No, like it's that? just a purely... It's the same as their 5059 satellite. I think that's why I'm getting that's the numbers the older right. One. That's the one that's, that's been around since the 90s, That's right? right. It's the same thing, except for it doesn't have a... Uh, input transformer on every single channel as the, as the 5059 does. So it just has the output transformers. It's got a minus six at the, on the, on the outputs as well. So you can kind of push, push some of the two bus channel, like push some of that, that stuff. If, if you want a little bit more, or you could put, technically you could push the console more. Meaning like you're pushing into the transformers in the output stage. Yes. But then it drops it down. Drops it down. Minus so it six. So you're not right. clipping exactly. into your next thing. Yeah. Cool. So that's a nice. Does it also have the stereo widening thing that the 50 no, thing does? Does not. It has nothing to do with. It's got uh, four different possible. So eight channels. You can one through eight. You can mark as mono, or you can switch back and forth between mono and stereo. And then nine through sixteen are all stereo. 
Um, so that's a nice, that's a really nice piece. And so I go through that as the, on the way out for printing mixes too, and listening to mixes as the two bus part of the, part of the path. Yeah. Um, What's the difference? What do you hear when you break it out through a summing mix? Like what do you, what's your experience? The, the, in the box versus when you break it out? Yeah, I've had, I've owned, I've only owned two summing mixers, so I can only kind of speak to the two that I had. Um, at, at first I bought the SSL, the, um, uh, I'm blanking on. I just got name. the big six in here. Nice, nice. I don't know if this that's no, that wasn't it. That was the, the was two, it the, the, um, the two are you the Sigma or something Sigma? Like that? Yeah, yeah, thank you. And um, honestly, they I don't they're they're a sponsor of the program, so I I'll just no, you can, you can it be wasn't a very good experience. Was, fine. Listen, I love the UF8. I totally love that. I did not have a good experience with with SSL on the Sigma. Um. And so I ended up not being, I just ended up not being able to use it. And I love the way it sounded. And what I found for that is that it, the stereo field just got wider and it was a nice, right. it was easier to define where things were within that stereo field. And that was a really great feature. Plus they had a bunch of different routing options. And in theory, I loved the Sigma, but their software side, I could never get them to answer a question for me. Yeah, it's tough. Uh, it's tough with some of the companies that we work with, with all of them, actually, you know, where it's like you're trying to figure out how to do something. And if they're a big company, it's just hard to get through. It's hard to get through. You know? And I, yeah. So, I, so I, I went to, so I was like, well, I love summing, but maybe I don't want to have to deal on the software side of things with summing. And so then I just wanted to do an analog thing. And I thought about getting the 5059. And then I think I decided to get a, a compressor. I could either afford a 5059 or the satellite 5057 and a compressor. And I was like, well, I'll use, I'll get more usage of the compressor than, you know, than the summing mixer. So I got, uh, so I got there's the simpler flagship now summing mixer and that's great. And the, I think that the width is just as much as a nice headroom on, on, on the, uh, orbit. I think it's called the orbit 5057. I'm sorry if I'm getting the numbers wrong. It's all but. right. Um, I remember when I was looking at the Sigma too, I learned about it and I was watching a bunch of videos about it. Um, I could hear, um, and and I experienced a little bit of this when I break out through my MCI console. Um, what I feel like I can hear in a breakout mix potentially is um, an immediacy to the the details in the top end, which I yeah. think lends to what you said. It, it sounds a little wider, sounds a little there's like a natural sheen that goes on it yeah. because I think it's just the highs are coming through, yeah. you know? Um, and, and I think that that it's, it's almost like it's, it almost, ex, the experience is like you get more clarity in the top end, but it's not like it's a boost of high frequencies. It's more like no. they just come through with detail and clarity or something like that. Yeah. But again, I got a jury still out for me. I've got my big six now and I'm going to be doing a bunch yeah, of mixing good. on that and seeing how it feels. My first um, messing around with it, I was like, this sounds awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. So I'm excited about it. Yeah. Um, and it actually has interfaced really easily with Pro Tools. Oh, good, like that. good. I I realized for me, I'm a, I loved like working on, at the, on the Trident for all these years. Um, and that has- This is it, a great sounding console it's, too. It's great. It's got in in transformers on the way in. It's got transformers on the way out, and that's I've realized maybe that's a really kind of easy statement to make or whatever. But I've realized like that's the sound that I like, and yeah. there is there's just something more for me, just personally. There's something more pleasing. I wouldn't be able to tell you like listening to the Sigma or listening to the the Orbit, like oh, it's seven K is really kind of speaking more clearly to me, and right. then I mean I. I'm sure it is. I, you know, uh, I but mean, do, do you get the impression that Skrillex really needs transformers yeah, on the way in and out? I don't know. That's no, like I don't. <laughs> that one might mix in the box very, fairly well. I don't know. I don't know how he makes records. I have, yeah. Or any of the EDM stuff, but it's, it's all, it's all. I think for, for those of us who grew up on, you know, classic rock records too, there's a familiarity to that sound. It makes sense with all the mics that we use on instruments yeah. and drums and I worked the whole at my old studio and guitars and all of it. Everything I did was in the box and some and those still on occasion there are things that I do that are that that stay in the box. It's rare but um so there's nothing wrong there's nothing well, wrong with any of this. Let's stuff. talk about some of that stuff. I don't know wh um, which ones were done when but um Katie Cuffell um Cuffell yeah 
1999, maybe it was the record of the song that I was listening to, but it's, um, well, 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 all the records you had there, um, Alligator was another one. They, um, they sound like the vocals, incredible sounding. Yeah. Thanks. So, That's... and, and I, I've been working on stuff and really like trying to figure out how to do the, get the best capture for female vocals and how to mix it and have everything just like right up there in your face. And a lot of your records have that where it's like, you know, everything's right up in your face. In fact, I, I listened to yours and I was like, I'm going to go listen to what I did. You know? <laughs> and then I was like, oh, oh I'm sure. I'm sure you know, we probably all great. feel that way all the time. Yeah, of course. But, but it made, makes me excited to ask you about, you know, some of the things you've learned about, maybe you learned some stuff from Neil, maybe you just learned Tons. it on your own, but like about getting a voice to just sound like right up there in the mix. It's not, it's not harsh. It's not too loud. It's not too quiet. You're getting all the stuff. It's like, sounds sort of like, you know, supernatural and it's, it's, um, you know, tonal quality and everything. What? Yeah. Talk about Katie's voice and how you like to record her. Well, first and foremost, I can't take credit for any, you know, Katie's got an amazing voice. So, and, and you go down the list of records that I've, that I've made. I think everybody, I'm really lucky in that everybody has a really, really beautiful and or interesting voice. And it's not that it's kind most, of an important starting point. Isn't yeah, it? of course, of course it has to be. And, and it all goes back to, you know, nothing is done. I'm going to, all right, so I'll get, I'll get meta for a, a quick second and then we can kind of micro go in on the details, but I'll go back to what, what we were talking about in the very beginning. Everything is, everything happens it's all intentional. So, you know, using both sides of your brain, the way that you pull a, a good vocal out of somebody starts from the handshake six months before you start recording. I really believe that. So, so I don't, and, I, and, then, and that's not a cheap answer. I mean, I really, really think like the more comfortable people, you know, I've, I've made records where people come in, I, I meet them on a Tuesday and we're recording on a Wednesday. That's super rare. And I actually don't even like doing that as much as I like when we have time to build the rapport and build the relationship and get to know each other. You get to, you know, people are much more easy to like, Hey, I'm, I'm feeling this way today. Can we try doing this song instead of that song and giving people permission to really flourish and, and thrive. So there's, there's all of those, there's all of those elements. Which is, that's sort of a parallel to like recording with your longtime friends, you know, yes, that, that's yeah. sort of built in, we take yeah. it for granted. Yeah, right. So the more you can, the more you can invite that into your experience, the more, the better vocal you're going to get. So yeah. and I'll add to that another parallel that I've experienced as an engineer are the times where artist is in there. I recorded it. You know, I'm thinking like yeah, it seems like it's all working. You know, producer points out that like, oh, that doesn't sound like you, or that's not that's you're not in your your proper form. And I realized that like as the engineer who's just new, like the, you know, met on a Tuesday recording on a Wednesday, I just didn't have any clue because I hadn't, you didn't have that familiarity sure. with the artist and the yeah. voice and everything to know yeah. when they're in their best form. Yeah. Here's a concrete example of, or here's how that can play, that's played out for me where, where everything, every decision that I make as mu as much as it's in my power to be is made intentionally. So one of the questions that I ask every artist that I work with is, Hey, if, if you had to, if you had to put you the record that we're going to make up on a shelf, what are the two records next to it that you, that you love the most? So somebody might say, Oh, it's a, a record by John Prine. Somebody else might say, Oh, it's a record by, you know, Tom Petty, or it's wildflowers or it's, it's whatever, you know, whatever it is. And that, and then we, you know, all of those things. And then there's another, there's a whole host of conversations that are similar to that kind of thing that we end up having in the pre-production process that filter into my decision of using a 67 with an 1176, or they're filtering with using an SM7 through maybe a tube tab, tube tech CL1B or something. Not or the something like, at least it's 3630. Hey, there's nothing wrong with, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that, that stuff either. So whatever these decisions are, they all get, you know, it's nothing is necessarily by accident. So, so that's what, that's the first thing. So the first thing is that Katie and, and, you know, all the people that I work with are all fantastic in their own, every, different and unique in their own way and all amazing. Secondly is nothing is necessarily really, uh, left by accident. So we move through the process from the handshake through to the mastering all with intention. 
And then, and then lastly, like there are some things, you know, I, I always put up two microphones at, at the same time. So I have two different chains happening and I'll blend them. I'll decide which one is working. I'll decide which one isn't working, making sure they're in phase, obviously, as much as you can. What would be an example of that? If you so, were to let, tell somebody for the first time, like, well, try this. To yeah, start. totally. Uh, well, you can pull up like a, an equivalent of the easiest thing to do would be pull up your, your best um, condenser microphones. So if you have anything that resembles a tube mic or anything that resembles a big diaf- a larger diaphragm condenser, and then throw up like an RE20 next to it or a 57 or a 58 even, or um, uh, an SM7, uh, or or as your mic collection grows, try throwing in uh, ribbon. I mean, my favorite combinations are tube microphones with a ribbon. So I'll use the, I have a 440 um, I have a 121. Uh, Coles sometimes makes me a little nervous to use, depending on people, depending on how loud they're singing and how directional that that is. So you you know you want to make sure that your ribbon can handle what whatever. If they have the budget to replace the ribbon <laughs> after the <laughs> session. I mean, I'm you know I'm not that precious with with this stuff. I, I would rather use it than 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 not. You know, but. That means you haven't opened one up yet and seen just how tiny that ribbon is. I never had. It's very true. I, I was going to repair one once. It, I had one that went bad. And so I opened it. I was like, well, maybe I should look at it first. And I opened it and I just moved it in the air. And it was like, it was like watching a thread of a spider web just like fluff wow. in the air. And I was like, oh my God. That yeah. Thing. It's like, no wonder it's fragile. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Makes me not want to drive in the car with it. Um, but, uh, just hold it out the passenger window while you drive. <laughs> yeah, driving. a great idea. <laughs> if you are mixing music, podcasts, or audio for video, and you want it to sound amazing, then Isotope has got your back. With RX, Ozone, Neoverb, Nectar, and VocalSynth, you'll have a collection of powerful apps and plugins that will help you get a professional sound in no time. Whether you're looking to clean up your vocal recordings with RX, master your tracks with Ozone, or add depth and ambience to your mixes with Neoverb, Isotope is your magic wand for awesomeness. Plus, with Nectar and Vocal Synth, you can easily add creative effects and unique textures to your vocals and instruments. From subtle mix enhancements to extreme sound design, Isotope takes your music and podcast productions to the next level. Go to isotope.com slash rockstars and use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off. And then I've, I have learned a, a ton, a ton from Neil. And one of, the, one of the best things that I ever did was decide not to try to recreate the, the wheel on all this stuff. And there's a wealth of knowledge from, from people like you. It's one of the gifts that you give everybody, myself included, from doing things like the, this pot, from doing this podcast specifically, and interviewing the people that you have, there's a wealth of knowledge out there that you know was not available 20 years ago, 15 years ago. And working under, I don't really want to, you know, Neil has has doesn't hire me as an assistant, so it's not like you know when he when we were talking, I I literally asked him. I don't know if he'd remember this or not, but he feels like he's just like a big brother to me today. And it has been like that. He's been a mentor for me for the last seven or eight years. I literally asked him, I was like, will you be my mentor? And uh, that was a wonderful conversation to have. And, um, you know, so that relationship has grown. And when I started working there, he was like, you can start, you know, it's a private studio, but it's a, but it's a great place to work. Commercial vibes, commercial quality with, with, you know, very similar to, to your, the vibe that you have here, commercial quality, but you know, a place that you can relax and be really creative in. And, um, and so, uh, working with him, looking over my shoulder occasionally, um, and going, you're not going to do it like that, are you? No, he's, (laughs) no, he's amazing. No, he's super gracious. He's, he's never, never, not even close, but I have, of course, like, uh, when I, when I have mixed there and do mix there or, you know, not with the client in the room necessarily, but I've totally been like, Hey man, will you come in and listen to this for a second? And there was one, I was mixing a record by my friend Ben Dorr up in Seattle. Um, and, uh, St. Paul defense is the name of his group. And, um, I just couldn't get his vocal to sit. I was like, what is wrong with this picture? And, and so Neil comes walking through. I'm like, Hey man, 
can you just listen to this for a second? And he go and you know, he takes I had I had the a Pultec EQ1 on on the vocal and I had it at 16 and I had it boosted a little bit. And he literally just moved it down to 10, 10 K. And he was like, there you go. And I was like, Son of a, you know, all I had, all you, and it was a combination of knowing the room, a combination of his years of experience of hearing something. And, and, um, and so there have been multiple, multiple, uh, you know, dozens and dozens of opportunities like that, that I, I, which have been a gift to me as, as the mentee and person who's learning from the master, you know? Yeah. And, uh, so I got, you know, one thing that, that another thing that might, this might be really helpful for, for people is, um, clip gaining and riding automation of the vocal of the lead vocal. But like, it's a, it's a marriage between getting the compressor set right and the ratio set right and the release and the attack time set right. Like, and but when, when I say right, all I mean is feels good for the song. And that's, yeah, this is, this is pure gold rock stars. So start taking notes on this <laughs> one. So what's the process then for doing that? What have you learned about the balance of, you know, the compression and the clip gain? And when do you set the compressor for what part of the song? And then yeah. when do you start adjusting the clip gain and all that? So clip gain, I, I tend to do earlier in the mix. And so I'll, so I, I, uh, sometimes I get hired as just a mix engineer, but usually the, like, I, I'm kind of one of those guys who likes to take everything from the beginning to the very end, except, except for mastering that I, I don't do that, but uh, so I'll mix all the projects that I produce. And so I have a, a really good gain for them. Well, normally it doesn't always work this way, but usually I've got a pretty good gain stage going happening throughout the, the, and that took me a long time to learn what that even really meant. And working in the analog world on the front end, when I first started working at Niels, that was a whole learning experience of like, oh, it really does interact digital with the digital information differently. And so learning that gain staging process. And uh, there are even still things that I'm learning today. But w- so uh, I tend to set my um, the gain staging relatively early if I need to make any adjustments and I have the vocal in from the very, very, very beginning. So it's for me, I start with kick drum, you know, kick and snare and overheads or whatever drums that I, that best, um, articulate the emotion of the song. So sometimes that is just like kick and snare and it's only that, or sometimes it'll be kick, snare and overheads for the verse. And then I'll bring in the rooms for the chorus or vice versa, or whatever the personality of the song is the emotion that we're, that we're going for. But I always have the vocal in there from the beginning. And then relatively early on, I'll set the stage for the vocal. So I'll, I'll decide on the chain and really commit to that chain. And so I've got outboard gear for that. I've got plugins for that. Just, it just depends again on what, what is happening. Um, recently, I tend to be a little bit more aggressive with the compression um, on the vocal, but it, I think it's just a kind of, and I don't mean to the point where it's taking away unless that's what we're trying to do, like really get that sonic imprint happening. But I try not to let anything distract from one thing I've learned from Neil is I try not to let anything distract from the vocal unless we want it to. But right. for the most part, we want that to be uh, hugged by the by the rest of the band. We want that vocal to be pocketed. Um, and it's really kind of like you have to kind of trust your instincts and and trust where you are because there's no right or wrong. I've done an indie rock project where I've I've mixed the song, mix, mixed the whole project, and I send the first mixes to the group, and they're like, "No, man, can you do- knock that vocal back? We want that like way, you know, more buried, way, in the yeah, track, yeah, more buried." So I'll end up, I'll end yeah, up our, like our singer in my first band. He's like always oh, just made us just wanted more guitars, less yeah, vocal. It's all, and there's no right or wrong. It's just kind of whatever the emotion, whatever the impact is that we're trying to get. But I keep the I have the vocal in there in the beginning because that of of course changes the, you know, the staging for the, the two bus and whatever compression that I have. And some songs I really want the compressor, the, the, the two bus compressor to, I want the vocal to hit that. So the other things get squished and moved to the side a little bit when, when that vocal is entering and when the vocal is, is backing off, I want everything to kind of like, you know, kind of ooze back into place across the stereo field. And so it depends on the tempo of the song. It depends on the instrumentation and the arrangement of the song. Uh, but that's something that I'm aware of. So, and other times you just want it bricked in the middle and there are different compressors that do different things. Right. So, 
So, you know, for me, the, like sometimes you want the vocal to breathe a little with the, with the dynamic of the right. performance. And sometimes you just want it to be like this immovable object. Exactly. Yeah. Unstoppable yes. force. Or yeah. Whatever. So I've found that the 2500 is great for, for the API, for, for the solid, when I want that thing, just kind of just centered. Yeah. It. Just yeah. right. Like, and the 2500 is, we often think that's a stereo compressor, but right. you could use a mono instance of it on, or do you use yeah, the no, actual I'm one? talking about for the two bus. So how the, oh, for how, the two bus. Yeah. Okay, so great. how the vocal is hitting the compressor at the two bus point. Oh man. So, so there's, there's, so we got to think about our two bus choice. If we're thinking about what kind of vocal we want. You don't have to do anything, but I've, I've found, I've found that it, <laughs> I've found that it, it, it helps, you know, and again, it all just depends on the emotion of what we're going I, for. I think your so. discography demonstrates that, that that seems to be working too. So well, uh, Roxas, thanks. reminder, um, go to the link in the, sh in the show notes in the description and um, click through and you can listen to all these records that Nick's talking about that he's made. They sound great. Thanks, man. Just don't be discouraged if you compare them to your own Stop. like I did. <laughs> Stop. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Um, let me back up on that a little bit. So yeah. when I think of vocal compression and stuff. So you got the two mix compression to think about, but you've also got the compressor, right. the chain on the voice. Yeah. And it's the three ways I imagine I might experience that. One is to just set a set it and look for a set it and forget it compression that I like. And then when something feels like I should bring the clip gain up, bring it up when I when it feels like I should bring it down, bring it down. Another version is set it so the verse vocal verses generally tend to be quieter than choruses, you know, sure, yeah. and at a lower octave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, there's two secrets just given right away on yeah. songwriting rock stars. Yep. Um, That's true, though. Maybe set it for that and then clip gain things down when the chorus hits so that it hits the compressor different. Another would be to set it for the chorus stuff, the, the power vocals and clip gain everything up into right. that compressor right. for the quieter. So what are your thoughts about those? And is the answer just do all three? Uh, is it? Oh, those are totally valid. Um, I, I have, I tend to, um, I'll usually do like, so if I'm, so if I'm in the mixing land, if I've got, and I'm sorry if there's no simple, uh, there's never a simple answer. So, but I, if I've got the drums and the bass in there and the vocal and some of the things on the left and the right, and I say to myself, okay, now I'm ready to really pocket this vocal. So what that means to me is it means everything else is now the vocal has been in there the entire time. And I've even been doing some small automation things to bring it up in the chorus, whether it's click clip gain or, you know, just literally like highlight and, and automate up one DB or two DB for the chorus or like whatever, whichever way gets you there. It doesn't mm -hmm. really matter. Um, so at, at, when I'm time to really, when it's time to really pocket that thing, I, by then I usually have the compression, the, the, the compression on the vocal itself, the chain itself. I usually have that more or less solid by that point. And so when I'm automating, I'm really just automating for things like, oh, if does this song, does this song require, or this passage in the, this vocal phrase require um, things to be more even, I guess, for lack of a better word. And if they do, if that's the vibe that we're going for, then I'll literally go in and, oh, there's the word the, let me bring that up 0.3 dB. Right. There's the word, uh, oh, there's, there's like, you know, this word and, and it's got a lot of sibilance to it. Let me, you know, I tend to use clip gain a lot for sibilance and for, for those kind of things. So I'll, there'll, there'll be a pass after, Usually, usually I get to the point where um where I'm pocketing the vocal and I'll be like, all right, there's you know all my T's and S's is like all right, they're killing me. Yeah, they're like <laughs> all right, I need to deal with this. Like you like everything about the vocal except for the when the T's and the S's yeah. happen. Yeah. And what I find is that we have this. Uh, I talk about this uh, with my interns more recently too. Is we have this great human ability to survive. Which means <laughs> when a nasty thing comes our way, our brain just tunes it out. Yeah. So we can survive that moment. But it sucks because later when we go listen and we're not, we get we get hit by it. We're like, ah oh, shit, that sounds terrible. You know? Yeah. So yeah. I realize that's why we, we often talk about fatigue in the studio and things like that. It's uh, yeah, there's fatigue, but it's also just like 
it's like all those times where I had a shitty car and only the driver's <laughs> side door would open and the passenger side door never opened. Um, and you just, li- I li- I would live with it for like a year until I was like, maybe I should fix that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's the same thing with mixing. So yeah. anyway, I'm just yeah, setting the stage for, you know, the, the T's and the S's. So continue, that's right. please. Yeah, that's great. So I'll get to a point where they, they do start to bother me. And that all goes back to our, our, you know, our, obviously our tracking situation too. And sometimes I'll, I'll say, well, I really love the tone of this, even though it's a little bit brighter, maybe, or it's a little bit whatever. And so those siblings, you know, that stuff is going to stick out a little bit more. I'll just kind of consciously make that decision and be like, yeah, but it sounds great. So, so then you, you know, you, you tame that. And then it's, for me, it's really about the fine points. Like I was describing I'll let, you know, one, 0.1 0.1 dB does make a difference. And it, sa- it sounds ridiculous, but it does make a difference. And so usually at that point, I'm at the widest, well, not the, the widest, but I'm at a really wide point in Pro Tools, you know, for the wave file. And I'm making one to two, you know, 0.1, 0.2, 0.3 moves to really get that thing to be popular. And that those in there. would typically be clip gains or something. Or, or, uh, oh, you mean like no, on the like S's in, and the T's and stuff. No, that I clip gain, I'll clip gain those down. So once I once I have that that stuff kind of settled where you don't want to take the, you know, the consonances are where a lot of the emotion lies right. in, a, in a vocal. It's, so you don't want you don't attack. want that because that becomes the detail of the, of yeah, the word. Yeah, to... right. So you so you don't want to you don't want to like strip all that personality away. That's the good that's the good stuff. But when you you know so you bring that stuff down to whatever you feel like is appropriate, and then I'll go in and I'll you know I'll widen my view in Pro Tools to really get the point one dB difference, point two, point three. It's not just it's you know, and so I'll do that on uh to make the just just to try to make that vocal as as level um because i've i've always found and maybe i'm doing something wrong but i've always found compressors like if you if you if you if you're super dramatic with it then they can tend to really be act like a leveler um and and really everything is like kind of dead even absolutely 100 percent and sometimes that's great but sometimes that's not the sound that you want. And so if I use like, you know, if I hit, if I'm like an LA-2A, if I'm hitting like 2 dB or 3 dB instead of like 15 or something like that on the vocal, there's a lot of, there's a lot of natural dips that'll just kind of naturally occur. And so those, sometimes I try to go through and I really kind of like, all right, there's a dip or there's too much. And I'll, and I'll automate that. And that's not fader riding automation. That's literally like you know, highlighting, click up that, this little face, this little space here, this, this word, the, or this, and the, for the you know, clip. Yeah. For the click game. And so when you're clip game, I mean, there's different ways to do it, right? You no, could, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Automation. That's actually oh, automation. like writing, okay. the, writing the automation. Writing the, the yeah. volume. Yeah. The move, volume. Right. Yeah. 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 Cause then, right. Cause if you clip gain, you're affecting the sound going into the compressor. Yeah. If you write, change the automation move, you're, you're affecting the sound coming out of the compressor. Right. So again, Rockstar is learning what the difference is for those by trial and error yep. is going to help you out and, you, and you'll you'll figure it out. When it comes to S's and T's, and and uh, I still don't know what the word is for ch and sh, <laughs> but apparently it's different because de-essers don't know what to do about those a lot of times. Yeah, it's funny. Very frustrating. OWC is your one-stop shop for flexible drive storage and connectivity solutions for your studio. The MiniStack STX for your Mac Mini adds two additional drives over a universal SATA HDD SSD bay and an NVMe M.2 PCIe SSD, plus three additional Thunderbolt USB-C ports. The OWC Thunder Bay 4 chassis, built like a tank, gives you four hot-swappable 2.5-inch RAID configurable drive bays plus an extra Thunderbolt 3 jack for daisy chaining up to five devices. Or check out the OWC Gemini Thunderbolt 3 dock with two RAID configurable drives and seven ports of connectivity, including a front side SD card reader, one gig Ethernet, two USB 3.2 ports, a dedicated display port, and an additional backward compatible Thunderbolt port. Get your studio connected with the mini stack. STX, Thunder Bay 4, and Gemini Thunderbolt 3 dock at maxsales.com slash rockstars. Use the custom link in our show notes because it's a great way for you to help support this podcast. So thanks, Rockstars. 
do you go in and select the actual audio and just sort of like slice it and then just bring that Cooking clip down that. on the S? Yep. So what have you learned about doing that? Are there some right ways and some wrong ways to do that? Have you ever, like, for example, sometimes I've done that and I bring the S down, I'm like, that's great. And then I listen to it and it's like, oh, wait, no, I can hear that. Yeah. So what um, what have you learned about that? Is it just um, adjusting your start and your end of your selection on an S or is it like using the clip gain line differently or, or those kind of things? Yeah. So, so selecting, um, I do this with breath, with breathing too. Because again, it, you just don't want things to distract. That's the number one rule for me. I want to be lost in what the in the vocal, whether it's yeah, whether you can understand the the, the lyrics or not. I want to be lost in the sound of the vocal. And so, for the S's and the T's and the Ch's and, and anything like that, um, I just tr- kind of trust my ears. And so I'll highlight, you know, for an S or a T, I'll highlight where it starts and where it ends. And and usually that'll be the only part that I clip gain. And it all depends on the phonics of, of how they're singing. But in a general sense, I'll I'll highlight that. I'll clip gain that down anywhere from two and a half. If I'm using some distortion in the chain somewhere, yeah, yeah it might even be as much as like eight or nine dB down. So it just kind of depends on what on what the vocal is hitting. And so I'll clip gain that down, uh, to, and then I trust my ears because you don't like we don't when we talk we don't we don't talk without our T's, we, of course, you know, right. like it has to sound normal. Right. It has to sound effortless. Right. Yeah. Or this... I, I find more often than not, the singer forgets to put the yeah. consonant on the end. You yeah. know, it's like, um, um, I, I can't think of a good example right now. Well, like maybe they're singing the, the word want and they're like, do, what do you want? Yeah. You know, and then the later you're listening <laughs> and I'm in the control, I'm like, you know, somebody might hear that. Does you are actually singing? What do you want? Not what do you want? Yeah, you know? yeah. And then I, and then it's a game of like trying to point that out. And then, but then they might sing one. It's like, what do you want? And yeah. then you're like, well, that's not really it either. Yeah. You know, it's so, hard. But it's funny how often singers fake out the last, the end of a totally. word because they're they're feeling the lyric and yeah. forgetting that it's also a word that needs to actually be audible in yeah. makes sense. It's hard, it's hard being a great singer. It is hard. It's really hard. And then, you know, the whole thing about uh, mic technique and uh, what yep. the hell that even is, right. you know, I sometimes I struggle to explain it to a singer. It's sort of like, you know, also there's the question of like, if they don't already know it, or like, what are they going to learn it all yeah. of a sudden on this session, yeah. you know? But there's, there's, um, moving around back and forth distance on the mic. There's singing slightly off mic and just turning the head and like throwing yeah. certain things off of the mic. Um, and then there's, it's really fascinating to me um, what, what I discover, especially with powerful vocals, powerful female voices, where it might go from breathy and intimate to a strong note. And where the strength is in those notes is in very unexpected places sometimes. And then I'm thinking like, how would you even adjust that middle syllable of that one note to affect the mic differently? But I do think that there's a there is a, a skill that can be learned on the mic where the singer actually learns to control what comes out of their mouth. Yes, under the mic differently. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and that and I don't know the best way to do that. Maybe maybe some of that is just practicing singing with headphones on. Yeah, too, totally. So you hear what it's doing. Yeah, the more experience you have in the studio, I mean, I'm sure you know this, and I, everybody can attest to this too. The more times you do it, the better you know. The the more comfortable you are, the better you get at it. Yeah, that's well. I've also I recorded think. singers who have a lot of experience singing, so they know what their voice sounds like naturally in a space or even on a stage mic. But then it might be their first time, right. you know, in a studio on a mic too. Right. But it is really fascinating. So. um, what else was I going to say about that? I guess going through and, and adjusting the clips on all those S's and T's and stuff like that is really a great skill. I guess you can become faster. I recently learned a couple of things which are pretty cool. Um, Melodyne, I think, has a feature now in it that um, will try and balance out the levels between all the different words in a line. So really? Melodyne views, you view, view them as these blobs, you know, yeah, and it yeah. says like, oh, let's, we can level them all because it's already isolated them as individual wow. words. 
And I think um, RX has a feature like that too okay. that will level voices. I haven't dug into it yet. The Melodyne compressor. Isotone has so much cool stuff. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So like, you know, and then a good differentiator too, Rockstars, is there's a difference between what I'm going to do on a podcast mix versus sure. what I'm going to do on a song mix. Of course, yeah. So there's no way in hell I'm going to go through an entire podcast and edit all those individual things. <laughs> That's why this episode is getting mixed with, you know, <laughs> DS from RX. Um, yeah. It's also, I use the AVA de from Harrison, okay. which is a great one, um, and has a visual, um, you know, heat map on it. So you can actually oh, cool. see the S's come up, the scrolling up in the heat map, and yeah. you kind of see where to put it. And then also uh, Ozone, I'll put dial in like dynamic EQ and just yeah. like dial, you know, zone in on it, seeing yeah. the S hit the frequency analyzer. So that's really useful. But on a three and a half minute song, it's like... If you really want to get that song right, then, you know, you, you got to put in the time to just kind of sculpt yeah. your way through it. Yep. And Dude. it's a challenge because we work on different kinds of records, different kinds of projects. Sometimes we can really put in that time. Sometimes we know that if we really want this to production, this song, this track to be where it needs to be, we're going to have to put in a lot of careful attention time into a lot of different elements. Yeah. And um, what about for you? You know, how do you navigate that? Because I, I think of you as somebody who's dead serious about your career and production. And I think of you as somebody who's being selective about the projects you want to work on so that you can give each one that final bit of attention. But you must, like all of us, be faced with like, oh, we can't have, how much time is this going to take? How much does that cost and stuff? Yeah. So how do you balance those sorts of things? We're right back to business again. Yeah, Sorry, no, it's, it's great. It's a great question. Um, uh, some of it I eat, you know, it's just the cost of doing business. By and not eating? So, you right. don't eat so you yeah. can eat it? No, you know, you know, when you've got mouths to feed, that's not an option. Yeah. Um, so I have definitely learned how to streamline some aspects of it. And, you know, for me, I, I don't do anything creative until every, just like you had mentioned earlier, the, this very good, good, good advice that I've heard on this podcast, um, a couple different times, like do all the editing, do all the, you know, the manicuring, whatever you need to do before you start doing the creative stuff. Cause I've found that, you know, so I go through and I do any, any tuning, any, like I get, I get, I don't have, I don't work with a template, uh, in the sense that, uh, I always start sending the snare through the, like, I don't work with that, but I do have a template of like, these are the 15 different tools that I like to have. And, uh, these are the, you know, whatever. So I have all, I have all of those kind of tools in my, in the pro tool session, uh, that I import in. And then I go through and I, and I just take the time to do the, um, all that landscaping beforehand. So if I, you know, when I'm in, when I'm in tracking mode, I'll have me or the assistant, I'll, you know, if whoever's running pro tools, I'll be like base fix. And they know to just go hit that, hit that marker and write base fix up there. You know, so there are, there are things that like that. And then, and then you obviously just in, in the state of mixing, whether you're in this, this mode or the creative mode, you're obviously listening intently. So you're going to catch more things. You're going to, oh, the, you know, the vocals. So bass fix is just dropping a marker when you're listening yeah, to fix come the, back and fix it. Fix the bass there, fix yeah. the drum fill there or, or whatever, you know, whatever, whatever kind of, whatever it is. Um, and so, uh, so I, you know, you, I go through and do all that kind of homework first. And what's funny to me is the, the, um, I'm right now I'm trying to figure out if I can get my assistant to mix prep things for me. I'm trying to f literally financially see if I can figure it out because yeah. what I've noticed over the last four or five records that I've mixed, and I don't know if this is just speaks to the new, the new me getting to know my, my current mix room that I'm in right now. But when I hit the creative stuff, I'm going a whole lot faster than I ever, than I ever could. So what I'm wondering is if I can, what I'm trying to figure out is if I can, um, hire out the mix prep to my assistant, mix things and actually charge the custom, you know, charge the artist less because there's technically less time happening or, or, or what, cause there yeah, might, there yeah. might be somewhere in there. There's a formula somewhere in there that I got to find. And so if I can, you know, that, you know, that's something that I do, but, but to answer your question, like sometimes you just have to eat the cost because 
Especially at the beginning when you're figuring it out because it's like development. It's like... Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. You know, there is just... Uh, it's just kind of getting like you just got to figure out your. What's the term for it for pharmaceutical companies? R and D or something? Uh, yes, like research, uh, yeah, and development. research and yeah. development. We have our own. Uh, sorry to throw us in with the pharmaceutical companies, but we have our own research and development for things yeah. we do. And and I, my version of that sometimes is I I run a try and run a timer on myself all all, all the time if I can with especially if I'm working for a client because even if I'm not going to charge for the time, I want to know how much time I actually yeah. spend on it so right. I can you know, assess my own workflow. Yeah. But then there's times where I'm like, okay, I'm turning the timer off because this is R and D. I'm figuring out how to yeah, use this yeah, new yeah. tool and try yeah. it out and stuff like that. Um, so one of the things you said about uh, an assistant, assistant is great. I love working with assistants. Um, not only does it help separate the assembly from the creative, but it even separates it from your own clouding your own thinking yeah. where you're having to separate internally in your brain. You're just yeah. handing it off and then picking it up and going again. And I do know that a challenge in doing mix prep, because I've done it before, one of the challenges is if you want to work with somebody who's not there with you and that is remote, then they have to have all the same plugins yeah. and everything so they can recreate it. Right. Otherwise, you have to have somebody come over to your studio or... Right. If you're very clever about it, you can do things like um, Michael Brower talked about, I think, where his assistant would, you know, use um, TeamViewer. Yeah. And you can have somebody remote log into your studio computer. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, but get ready to put on, there's more R&D in that one. You know, you <laughs> yeah. got to figure out how to do it. Yeah. But you can have somebody else log in and do assemble it on your computer. So you do it. I know for me, the biggest challenge with that was um, I find that as I go from song to song, it's I, my template is evolving each moment. And then I'm like, song four, I'm like, which song had the organ on it that was stereo so I can pull that one? And which song had the drums that I liked? And so yeah, it was, it was challenging to figure out like a version of, you know, preemptively knowing what shape the song should be in. I, I think that some people also have success with that where you have a really trusted assistant that you develop a great working relationship with. And then there, you you really rely on them to make a lot of those decisions. Yeah. And they go in and without your guidance, you know, take a yeah. song and, and make sure it's sort of pre-mixed before yeah. you even address it. Yeah. And it's already, you know, in your ballpark. For me, I'm, I know I'm still talking here, but for me, oh, um, one of my versions of that was the Bonnaroo experience working yeah, with- right, um, exactly. Um, megahertz, uh, Michael Hardesty, I'm yeah. uh, working with Will Keensel in the studio, both of those guys, they would, uh, I would, we'd have a system going and then I'd walk out from having met the band on the live floor. And as I walk up to the console, they literally like hand me headphones. They're, they're already opening the headphones so they can put them right on my head. Yeah. And I just put them on. And it's like, there's the beginning of the mix. And that was yeah. a great experience. Yeah. But it takes a minute to get there. Yeah. Um, but the last thing I wanted to say about it was the very first bit you said, which I think is a great takeaway for us rock stars, is what a cool, simple solution to if you can listen to a track and then either verbally, you know, say something about each moment or drop a marker as something goes by, like bass fix, drum fix, you know, maybe you even got little codes for them. Mm -hmm. And then you just hand that off to an assistant, even through the internet. Mm -hmm. All they have to do at that point is they don't even need plugins. They could just open up. I mean, they might if you've got a mix started, but they could open up a session and all they need is to see those markers. And if and if somebody who you trust who can know that like, oh, clearly that feels fucked up right here or the timing's out or things don't drop at the same time. Yeah, maybe you can just take the raw tracks and get somebody to really straighten things out for you and send yeah. it back ready to for you to jump in and, you know, cleaning heads and tails. That's not hard to do. There's a lot of stuff that's, that anybody could do with, you know, yeah. the right understanding. Yeah. I think it, it, it goes to, uh, just communicating and having somebody that you trust. And, you know, Tom Elmhurst is, uh, there are two, my, my two, some of my two favorite mixing engineers, one would be Ryan Freeland. And from, from Ryan, I learned, um, who was ama amazing. Everybody should check out his work, Amy Mann to, um, uh, the Bar Brothers, just well, just really great stuff. He's a, he's he, Ryan's amazing, um, and he's somebody that I really learned. Like you, really, you go the distance. You do the work. 
you, you can, number one, you're not always sure of what's going to end up getting you the next gig. Meaning like, oh, I don't want to fix this thing. I don't want to take the extra half hours I'm going to have to take to go in and do this. And then you ask yourself, yeah, but would it be better? And if the answer is yes, you go do the work because you don't know who's going to hear that. You're, you, you're not in charge of what's going to become super, super popular. And the last thing you'd want to do is something that you know that you have asked gets gets to be super popular. And you, you, you never want to you never want to be the reason that something doesn't do the best it can be. And that's something I, I, I learned from Ryan and his work ethic. And, um, and then I don't know Tom Elmhurst at all, uh, but I've just through watching blogs or interviews or whatever. I love his system with, with his assistant. He'll hire somebody for four or five years. It takes a year to, tr- so while, while person A is about to graduate, quote unquote, he takes it, the person B will come in for the final year of person A and that person trains this person. And so there, there's this, you know, and it's only every five years. And he, he tells everybody, he's like, I'm going to fire you the day you turn 27 or whatever his, whatever his thing is. Right. So he takes these young, you know, these young guys and gals and, and, uh, they get a great training and there's kind of like this working rollover system that I'm not in that position where I can I can do that yet, and I can't. I don't have an assistant every. Se- I don't want to. You know, I don't have an assistant every single session that I do. I do for most of the main for all of the main tracking stuff. But I'm trying to figure out if I can find this formula. I might be able to hire somebody, um, hire hire an assistant for more. And my goal is to get to the point where I'm kind of doing the Tom Elmhurst thing, where I like, yes, I do want you to tune these vocals. I don't want it. I don't want 18 different Pro Tools tracks. I want everything summed down to two. And then I want to be able to put them on the console, not for fader rides, but just to have all background vocals are being summed into channel 13, 14 or, or whatever, right? Right. And then that's all part of like how now, so that when I, you know, when Tom sits down, Mr. Mr. Uh, sorry, Mr. Elmhurst sits down, uh, all he does is like hits play and listens and then starts doing the creative stuff. And if he needs like, Hey, I'm not happy with the stereo mix or the breakout of the or the the sorry the summing of the background vocals. Hey, man, you need to tune the the you know it's actually supposed to be a minor third in that vocal chord. You need to retune this, and he sends it back to the assistant, and they break it out again. They re you know they redo it, and it, but he's sitting there being like, "Well, now I'm going to mix the bass and the drums together, and well, that's being fixed, you know." So they've got a, a working relationship where they know um, what how how far the assistant can go. And in where that handoff and really define what that handoff looks like. Cause I don't think I would be really comfortable with them doing like, I don't want them to mix it. And then me come in and be like, Jan Hammer, good to go. That's a business model that I think is great, but it, I don't know if That's I would. That's not what you're looking for. Not, yeah, I, that wouldn't necessarily yeah. be my, my vibe. And yeah. so, um, I mean, maybe if I'm 70 years old and my, I'll be like, I'm too tired. It's great. Just do it. You know, I don't want to, you know, it's fine. Um, but uh, you know, anyway, it's not. It's that's not for me today. So, do you ever feel like the time that you've spent watching YouTube videos, trying out mix tricks, and tweaking version after version of your mixes has gotten you nowhere? Have you been looking for a simple, straightforward, step-by-step process for creating a pro mix that won't take you years to learn? What if you could have a Grammy-winning mix engineer who understood all your mixing struggles and could coach you through them? If you struggle with any of these questions, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is just for you. Now you can discover the proven step-by-step mix system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating a pro-quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Listen to this quote from one of our students, David. Quote, absolutely the most informative and helpful block of information and mentoring on the mix process that I've ever been a part of. That was like sitting behind a mix engineer for years, watching and picking up tips along the way, but condensed into a six to seven hour session, close quote. Look, I'm so confident that this will take your mixes to the next level, that if you can't get a killer mix within 30 days, I'll give you a full refund, no questions asked. So if you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy winning quality, then go to ultimatemixingmasterclass.com and start now by checking out the free preview of the ultimate snare mixing trick. And I'll see you at the front row table of the Grammys. 
Cheers. Yeah, that's a cool yeah. concept, though. Um, and that really does come from the understanding the entrepreneurial business model. My brother would talk to me about that, about how you have somebody um, become skilled at a particular part of the business, and then you a ask them to write the manual for it. And right. that's what you did for your music teaching business. Right. And um, my my version of that here is occasionally... When I have a new intern come, I try and have them overlap with the old intern. Yeah. And then I say, you know, welcome them. And then I have, I say like, you know, go kick around the studio with the old intern. They just kind of show them around. And so yeah. it's like, you know, not huge training, but it's like, yeah. oh, here's where stuff is. And, and, and they, they get a sense of things. And another version for me has been, um, we, I found myself early on teaching the same basic shit to each intern that came along and then it's like, wait, this is, this doesn't feel very efficient, you know? Yeah. So then it was like, well, we're going to create a, our own little private, you know, YouTube playlist. And then nice. I would have, when I would teach an intern how to do something, I'd have them videotape me. There I, I just aged myself. I said, videotape. <laughs> <laughs> you shoot a video of me and, uh, and then upload that to our YouTube channel into the playlist and then the next intern comes along and the very first assignment is go watch all the YouTube videos. Yeah, you know? that's great. That totally makes sense. Yeah, it works pretty well. But then inevitably, like, you know, we got to clean the bathroom or the trash needs to get, we need to put the bag in the trash can. I'm like, did you watch the video on that? Um, I, I can't, I think I did. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, go yeah. Watch it again. yeah. <laughs> there is yeah. a video of me cleaning the toilet. <laughs> yeah. This is how it's done. <laughs> There's a reason. Why, yep. why I did it to show. Anyway, um, we are getting to the end here. Thank you again for coming here. Thank you. Um, let's do, go to our closing question next. Let's do it. You get to take the way back studio machine once again. Once again. All right. Zip, dip, 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 I'm ready. Dip, dip. Go back in time and find young Nick, who's like, man, if only I, maybe 52 songs in 52 weeks wasn't enough. Maybe <laughs> I need to do a 104. Is that the right one? Is that the right number? Yeah. Yeah, it uh, works. No. So um, you go back in time and you say, listen, Nick, I've come back to give you this one bit of advice. Here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What would you go back and tell yourself if you could? Yeah, uh, keep the faith. That's keep the faith. That's, that's, I kind of view that as my, that's my daily job. My what daily kind of faith? job is to. What is, does faith mean to you? Uh, well, having nothing to do with the religious context. It's really just. Um, it can be very stressful being an entrepreneur. It can be very stressful being a business owner. It can be very stressful being an artist. It can be very stressful working in the music industry. How about how about um, husband and dad? Yeah, <laughs> that's a little yeah, stressful sometimes. Yeah, too, well, isn't it? yeah, of course, man. And and you know, life wonderfully and beautifully happens to us as we go through it. And so, when I first started, I wasn't married. Uh, when I you know, and then I was. And when I first moved to Nashville, I wasn't. I didn't have kids and now I do. And every single day, if you had asked me at, let's see, I was 35 when I had my first kid. I've got, we've got, I'm 42 now. And I was 35 when we had our first kid. Uh, a little bit later, I wish I would have started earlier. But that's for a different podcast, uh, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, and uh, at 34, if you had told me that I would have three boys, yeah, you moved down from the icy north and scored a hat trick down. Yeah, there. It's yeah. really no kidding. Uh, something in the something in the water here. Um, that I would have three boys and I would be able to and, and Meredith, you know, did her own through her own choices have has has decided to be a stay at home mom this whole time. So if you had told me that I would be able to at thirty four at 42, raise three boys and afford it and build a studio and start it and build a dream studio and work with the most amazing, wonderful people, wonderful artists, I would have said, I have no idea how to make that happen. So you're crazy, man. What you Well, talking? honestly, every single day, it's like, I, I, when you look back, it's easy to be, to say, wow, I, ha I really don't know. They were all micro decisions, right? They were yeah. all just at living, you know, one day at a time and doing the best we can. And understand. I mean, I'm ambitious. I have goals, of course. I, I, um, but every day I wake up and I just say, you know, now that I've been doing it for, I've been. This is this is year ten. It's September will be my our tenth anniversary. Moving Happy down. Happy birthday! Hey, thanks. <laughs> uh, not yet in September, but 
I don't know if this is a 10 year town or not. I've heard people say that. I've heard people say it's, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's such a dumb, it's, I mean, whatever it's, it is what it is, but I, I, Uh, um, if it is, I messed up 20 years ago. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, it's funny. I, I don't even know what that implies, but I, I would say that the, now I wake up and my job is to keep the faith. It's to, it's to manage that anxiety. It's to understand that I don't have to have all the answers right now. It's to get out of my own way. Yeah. It's to get out of linear thinking and be more in nonlinear being. And that's a very meta hippy dippy thing to say, but it's like, it's really, it's really true. Um, so. Well, it's funny. I mean, the, the point in my life and career where I did consider moving and I remember actually following a buddy of mine around, he, he gave me a tour of the Brooklyn area. Like maybe yeah. I should move to New York where my brother is. Yeah. Know, was about 10 years. Yeah. And into having lived here. Into living in Nashville. Yeah, a little, little bit before that, I think. But no, no, it was still, it was actually about 10 years. I think I'd already bought my house and then I was reconsidering. What was the, what was the driving force to, I just to say was, that wasn't uh, well, the right I was, move? I was very single at the time, you know, so, so I wasn't, yeah. I could do whatever I wanted. And I just thought, um, I was interested in the creative stuff that maybe was happening up there. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I don't know, I guess I was just thinking about, a something new. And then I, and then after the tour, I came to the conclusion, I was like, I was like, oh, wow. So it's like, um, so basically what I learned is like, I can find a teeny tiny apartment up there and pay a lot more than I pay down here to live day to day yeah. um, and still make the same amount of money. Still, you know, still be lucky to make 25 bucks an hour. That sounds great. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, oh, I think I'm going to stay here. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, um, yeah, man. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah. That would That's be the awesome. thing to, to just not, you know, it's, it's not don't do your due diligence because obviously you have to, like you must, you know, it's the yin and the yang. You can't, yeah. you know, but. I know how, what I wanted to add to that was the experience of you don't really know how you're going to get from point A today to point B in the future. You've got, you can, you can point your rowboat in the right direction right. and hope it's the right direction, right. but you don't really know how you're going to get there. Right. Um, but after enough times in my life where I looked and I was like, well, I might be at point A trying to get to point B, but I'm also at point A, B, because I just came from the last point A. Right. And I kept, and I was like, well, I just keep finding that like, no matter what I think moving forward, somehow I got here and I'm here now. So maybe that's just all I need. Then yeah. that's the keep the faith is like, yep. it's just going to keep working, you yep. know? Yeah. Just keep pointing your rowboat in the right direction. It's one, you know, it, it, it's, that's my daily job. And even in the face of, of, you know, like I'll, I'll be talking to uh, a part uh, a client and, and uh, maybe we worked together in the past. Maybe we haven't, but maybe for whatever reason, they, on a Monday, they greenlit the project. And on a Tuesday they say, Oh, actually I got to wait for, you know, six months. I can't do it today. So there goes X amount of income that I thought was just there on a Monday. It's now gone on a Tuesday and it's real hard to say. Yeah. But luckily there was that band that you met on a Tuesday that came in on Wednesday. So you're good to go. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, so thank you for joining us on the show again, Thanks man. It's really me. awesome to hang with you. Let the rock stars know where they should go to go find out more about you, go listen to your music. Um, what about that uh, killer assistant engineer who just heard what you said and they're like, ooh, I think I might be the the, the one for the job. Um, how, how should people find you and, and reach out to you if they want to make their next hit record? Yeah, uh, nickbullockmusic.com is the website. and B-U-L-L-O-K. O-C-K. 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 Excuse yeah. me, O-C-K. Yeah, I, Same last spelling as Bob Bullock. Also, yes, also another, a legend. Uh, legend having, on the show. Uh, not, not that I'm saying. I'm, yes, Bob Bullock is a legend. Um, uh, yeah, nickbullockmusic.com. I'm on Instagram, uh, Nick Bullock Music or at Nick Bullock Music, however that works for Instagram. And those would be the, the two best, best things to do. And Nick is climbing the music ladder, but don't be confused for the, uh, the other <laughs> famous rock climber that shows up on Google a lot. That's hilarious. Yes. Who owns <laughs> nickbullock.com? Yeah. Unfor- unfortunately Dang for it. me, Dang good for it. him. <laughs> well, you rock more than his rocks or That's whatever. Hilarious. There's some, there's some pun in there. Yes. You'll, we'll find it after we leave. <laughs> awesome. Rock stars. Thanks so much for listening. Nick's thank, thanks for being here. And thanks, Liz. thank you. Look forward to seeing you around. See you. Can't wait to see your new place. Yeah. Got to come out. All right. Cheers.
Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rock stars now go make great music recording studio rock stars would like to give a big thank you to our awesome sponsors who help make this episode possible owc lewitt adam audio isotope and Spectra 1964. And remember, at isotope.com slash rockstars, use the coupon code ROCK10 for 10% off any plug-in purchase. If you enjoyed recording Studio Rockstars, then please check out our sponsors using the link in our show notes because it's a great way to help support this show. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. I would also like to thank our fantastic team here at Recording Studio Rockstars, Vlad Wesselchenko and Braden Stremming for additional podcasts and video production. Thanks so much for listening, Rockstars, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.